Oh. Oh. Hey, everybody. Hey. hey. Do you guys? Do, I don't know if I don't know if you all know this. Do you, Do you know this anime called Higurashi? No. 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 Mm. Never. Never heard heard it. Really Not really. It. All right. Well. All right. Bye. Really also, I can't <laughs> wait for someone to think that this is a furry stream because we howled at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh man, I I just laughed so I like, like Rena would you, really like furry stuff. Did you just hear me? I just laughed yeah, exactly did. like Oishi. <laughs> <laughs> I, did you hear that? What the fuck was that? Anyway, hi. Uh, we're here to talk about Higurashi Arc Six, uh, what many consider to be the best arc of Higurashi. And you know what? After playing it, I can see it. I can see it. So with me today is Numbers, a.k.a. 25, a.k.a. 2578916. Hello. Hey, uh, and what are your pronouns, 25? Um, I'm they or I'm it if you're really cool and based. Hmm. <laughs> Arp, Ar Arp, you're wonderful. Arp is here, everybody. Arp. Hello. What are your pronouns, Arp? I use they, them. Also, I prefer Elise, but that's fine if you forget. Okay. Uh, I will make a note of that. I would have changed my uh, display name, but it's disabled on your server. Oh, shoot. I will definitely... Uh, actually, I can do that for you. So how do you spell it? A-L-I-S. A-L-I-S. That's a Y, you idiot. I'm. Uh, why can't I type? Okay. And your, uh, uh, they, uh, what was it? They, them? They, uh, she, they, or they, them. She, they, or they, them. Okay. They, them. And then 25 is it. Because I am cool and based. I don't know about y'all. And then we have Gail. Gail, what's up? Good. I'm going to talk about the knowledge. My pronouns, usually they, them. He, him is okay, too. Okay. Gail, Gail, constant source of amazing information. Wonderful. Like, honestly, every time Gail posts something, it's just so packed, chocked full of info, new info. Wonderful, wonderful person to have here a with us. A pinata of delicious information. <laughs> no, no need to, to, to hit him. No, don't do that. No. Uh, indestructible cat. Hello, me and Bob are going to have a fight in the roof after this. Oh, who gets the bat? Well, I'll get the bat. You can be right now. So I win. <laughs> yeah, you're the best character, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, just giving it right to me. What are your pronouns? Uh, Any and all, but you can go with they, them. Okie dokie. They, them. Uh, then we got Laura High. Laura High. What's up? Hello. Um, I hope everyone is ready to enjoy some clowns milling about. <laughs> is that are we the clowns or? It's a lie. Yes, it's we're 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 the clowns. Yeah. <laughs> it's from and, the it's from the difficulty, I think. Oh, yep. right. Yes, you're. Yes, absolutely. Just a bunch of clowns milling about. Lara, hi. What are your pronouns? Uh, she, her. She, her. Okie dokie. Ludzu. Ludzu, what's up? How you doing? Hi. Uh, happy holidays also. Happy holidays. What are your pronouns, Just Ludzu? I am, uh, I'll go with he, him. Thank you. Sure. Okie dokie. Murder bear. In all caps. Sorry. It's all in all caps. Murder bear. Ren Ryuko has never done anything wrong. Uh, my preferred pronouns, I guess you can just go they, them, but murder bear is fine. Okie dokie. Olo, I love your name because it's just like mine. It's the same front words and backwards. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. What are your pronouns? Uh, my pronouns are he here. Okay. Talzrael, my fellow, my fellow Higurashi first time enjoyer, blind experiencer. How you doing, buddy? Doing all right. Pronouns register as he him. All righty. Turin, what's up, Turin? How you doing? 
Howdy, doing good. How are you? I'm doing quite well on this ho on this pre-holiday day. This is uh, what is this? Uh, uh, Eve Eve of Christmas, I guess. Yes, Eve's Eve. Eve's Eve. What are your pronouns, Turin? Uh, I am he him. He him. Okay, dokey. Yawn. Yawn. The the. Let's let's all let's all give. A, well, that's the wrong one. Let's all give a a applause oh, for Yawn. Give it up for Yawn. Yawn, how the fuck are you doing? I have a twenty-five page scrapbook, which is eighty percent lies. <laughs> oh shit. That's a reference. I finished a visual novel. It's good. <laughs> Jan has a visual novel that I have had on my desktop that I need to play, but I am terrible and hyper focused like a motherfucker and have not been able to mess around with it yet. I am planning on it uh, possibly uh, when I get some work done after I, uh, you know, editing and all that stuff. But you don't need to hear about that. Jan's the real MVP for today because guess what? Jan did a recap for all of this shit so i don't even need to do anything i just i'm just gonna sit back and let yawn take over and i'm gonna be a little shit and i'm gonna like like say stupid crap while yawn's like going off and with all this wonderful notes and stuff thank you <laughs> i have i'm gonna post the uh I just posted the link to my document in the stream chat, the one in Discord, so that if we can review that, we can review that later, uh, kind of keep track of it as we go through. Hopefully, like, if there's anything that we forgot, it should be in there. Uh, kind of keep tabs on what we want to talk about later as we come back around to it. Uh, hopefully, just provide some good structure. I was hoping that we could do the synopsis, then the first-time viewer thoughts, then the gen chat. So, uh, if you'd like me to start with a synopsis, I can definitely do that. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. But before we do that, what are your pronouns? Oh, she and they. She, they. Perfect. Okie dokie. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if, uh, just before we get into the synopsis stuff uh, real quick, I know I jumped in and, and had a little fun with that intro, but I just wanted to say, Jan, thank you very much, um, earnestly for doing this for us. Yeah, uh, for people who don't know, um, Jan basically correctly identified an, a major issue with the last uh, stream in that um, it was rambly, lo too long, and shitty. And uh, yeah, Jan is uh, helping us structure everything and keep the flow going while also being, you know, informative and uh, helping everybody like sort of pitch in and, and talk about specific things. So yeah, again, Jan, MVP, let's go and do this without further ado. Gail deserves credit as well. Gail, Gail always deserves credit. That's just a that's just an unspoken rule. <laughs> Gail, all is, right. we're well, always okay. thanking Gail I can over do here. <laughs> all right, go for it. Okay, first it starts with the prologue, which is the confrontation with Reyna in the junkyard. The club has approached her. She's talking about something. I don't believe it's entirely clear what. And she said, you know, basically I'll get into my reasons of why I did all this. Then it goes to day one. Uh, the days as defined aren't exactly like literal days but like mini chapters and there's like the larger chapters anyway day one we have the club doing their water pistol fight it basically demonstrates all the characters individual strengths and approaches to conflicts uh mion is kind of using superior resources and planning to pin some people down keichi is being very brash kind of throwing himself in there satoko's using the traps of course Reyna is trying to be a little bit clever, too. It basically ends with Keiichi going up against Reyna, having a great time. And then it doesn't really have a definite end with which one of them wins. Everyone else loses. Uh, day two, they're walking home together. Reyna doesn't want Keiichi to come over to her house. Not very clear why. Day three, Angel Mort. Love it. Just absolutely the best. The only thing that you need to know is that we meet a woman named Reyna who knows Reyna. Are we going to talk about Angel Mort? I I don't think that we need to. Do we have we to? to? I think I, I think <laughs> I don't I think, think we have to. It happened. I I, I don't, would rather not. It happened. I, I don't. I don't want to acknowledge the cake fucker. In in the mod <laughs> where we fix things, that that just that's just not there. Yes, okay. Exactly. Um, I think just I the words before, but... like like a Fight Club flash of the word in giant impact font covering the entire screen, cake fucker, and then that's it. 
<laughs> okay, uh, day five, uh, I'm sorry, day four, we see Rena hiding in the junkyard instead of going home. She goes into a abandoned sedan, just climbs in there, talks about how she made it her own little hideout, and she feels safe in there listening to the rain. I love Rena. Day five, she thinks about her mom, how, you know, basically her backstory of how she grew up. She lived in Hinamizawa, she was born there. She grew up there until about elementary school, I believe. Then her mom's job took them away out of the city. She became very successful. Uh, saw, started seeing another man, divorced her dad. Reina basically felt that her home was being broken up. Um, she struggled with mental health in day six. Uh, and day seven. And day tried to feel herself and day nine. feel better. <laughs> I just copying Rena struggles with mental health is probably worth copying and pasting throughout every single day, but go on. Absolutely. So she thinks about basically what she's been through, how she's, uh, they had to move back to Hinamizawa because of her struggles, but she couldn't accept life outside of it. There's some stuff which is lightly touched on, but not entirely gone into detail with. Um, she thinks a lot about how she's supposed to be feeling better because she's back in the village. Everything's supposed to be better. So she needs to just make herself feel better. She just has to try harder. He feels everyone else has it so much harder than she does so why doesn't she just feel better she feels guilty about it basically um day seven she goes into okonomiya she sees rena also being called ritsuko here with tepe they are handling a shady loan transaction where basically they're playing good cop bad cop kind of bad loan shark worse loan shark trying to force some people into paying them a ton of money um she sees Sion and Kasai, and they basically break it down for Reina that they are they're fraud artists, they're con artists, and they're running marriage scams. They've got somebody on the hook right now for a lot of money. That man being Rena's dad. Rena Badger is game. currently dating Rena's dad. They call it a badger game, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds right. So Rena goes home and investigates her dad's finances and finds out that he's been withdrawing a ton of money for her, like literally paying for a condo, which is one of my notes. It was something like just an absolutely absurd amount of money, like at least half a million dollars. Yeah, it was yeah, like nuts. hundreds of thousands. And that's yeah, just for so how does how did he, that work? Was that like a monthly thing or was that for just like paying it out for like a, a year? I think it was just like for buying it, but there was also talking about how you needed like, uh, there was like an expensive maintenance fee and something about oh. like deposits. It was just, it was just an unreasonably high amount. There was also yeah, the- was something like $4,000 a year, US dollars in maintenance. And uh, someone in the discord may have updated that to approximately $2,022. I forget which, I forget whether that's 83 or $22. And if- um, um, you don't, this is way too much, you know, that we're focusing on this, but at the same time, it's like, I, there's something that I think we all missed from that, which was, it was also a, um, it was a, what was it called? A, uh, a specific type of lottery that they were doing for it, where you could pay the same amount of money to get at, to, to buy that, um, condo, um, by paying for it, uh, paying the same price like twice or three times or however many times uh, basically you can stuff the the uh the the you could try and pay for more tickets basically to win um the lottery for that and so the way I that you would do that is pay is a shit ton of money 49 million eight hundred thousand yen which comes out to you as of today four hundred eighty one hundred thousand eight hundred twenty five <laughs> which is a lot for one guy to pay for his girlfriend's condo He's like spending half the time at his place anyway. Wasn't so, there also um, the um, bubble economy at the time? I wonder if that uh, yes. adds to that a bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I think it was late 80s or early 90s was when the bubble burst. So 83 would have been right at the heart of the bubble. Yeah. So basically, I believe Rena thinks about how she's like, I can't tell him about this. He's not going to listen to me because that woman has trained him to be loyal. Um, day eight, she thinks about uh, her meeting with Oyashiro Sama and she gets flashing lights in her head and she does not want to remember. She goes to the junkyard after going home and seeing Rina. She does not want to see her. She doesn't like the smell of her perfume. Rina it, follows her. 
the junkie. Hey, Jan, uh, real quick. Can you, uh, you're sounding a little echoey to us. Do you want to, uh, maybe something happened to your mic or maybe you want to. I'm not doing anything different. Does it sound rough? Yeah, it's, it's really weird. Um, it's like, it sounds like it may be doubling up. Uh, you want to try leaving and then coming back real quick? I left and came back because I thought it might be on my end. Yeah, I saw you do that. How about now? Uh, talk a little bit more. How about now? Ooh, some. I mean, I don't hear the echo, but you're. It sounds like you're being. Yeah, you sound like Glados. It says Tanstar. Uh, talk a little bit more. I'm. I'm sorry. No, uh, you're perfect. I, you're fine. Really sure oh, you're good right now. Yeah, it's good now. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry about that. that no, don't I, worry about I, I don't it. Know what the deal is. It's oh, not your fault. Worry. It's not your fault. It's tech is <laughs> tech is bullshit. Technology is fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm mm -hmm. new to the whole uh, chatting thing to begin with, so I'm not really familiar with this stuff yet. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Um, so sorry. Day eight, she's thinking about her memories of Oyashiro-sama. She does not like to think about it. She gets flashes in her brain when she thinks too hard about it. She goes home, sees Rena at her home. She doesn't want to be there, so she goes to the junk. Rena follows her. Rena tells her that she plans to marry Rena's dad and mm. claims to be pregnant. She says that she's a Christian, so she can't get an abortion. Uh, Rena doesn't accept it. Sorry, I heard a, I heard a noise. It might have been me going, but you yeah, know. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, Rena doesn't accept her. She says, no, I won't let you do that. So, Rena tries to murder her. Rena kills her in self-defense and chops the body up into pieces, then hides the pieces in a fridge. In day nine, Rena tries to tell her dad about the scam. Tepe arrives because of his plan to force him to pay up. Rena is like, hey, can we talk about this outside? She takes him to the junkyard, kills him also. Just girl boss stuff right there. Exactly. I mean, we support Rena and her decision to murder. Rena never did anything wrong. Wait a minute. Yeah. Is someone someone's yeah. name in this document is very Oh, okay. Never mind. I thought it was Takano. <laughs> someone changed their name to <laughs> Takano and I was like, oh, "She's here. <laughs> Quick, hide." It's the scrapbook. It's this this is the scrapbook. You're absolutely right. Oh, if we need to talk about that. that I have this, I will be killed for it. Oh, it's it, absolutely. Uh, we need to talk about the tip after the, oh <laughs> man, that final tip. Holy shit. Wow. Anyway. All right. Yeah. I don't really have the tips recorded in the synopsis just because there's so much of it. I do have some of them in more contacts later. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. As of day 10, reina has been missing from class for a little bit. People think that she's just not feeling very well. Um, Meanwhile, she's looking for places to hide the bodies. Her friends decide that they want to go on a treasure hunt because they can't play Mahjong with three tiles missing. So they're like, hey, let's go check out the junkyard. Um, cuts to the club confronting her about the dead bodies. She breaks down the reasons why she does it. She did it. She says, basically, I was justified. I don't feel bad about it. I won't do it again, but I don't feel bad about doing it because I didn't have any other choice. I couldn't have gone to you people for help. You wouldn't have been able to do anything, even if you wanted to. Look at the previous years. You didn't do anything then. You didn't stop it from happening. You couldn't help. She basically breaks down all of their sins, the reasons that they weren't able to help before. Keiichi admits to feeling bad about being ignorant about how much she's struggling, because he's this whole time been talking about how boring life is and how easy Reina has it, because she's so happy all the time. So he tries to urge everyone to work together and help her bury the bodies because they're friends. That's what friends do. Yeah. Oh, and and you, if any of you killed people in probably self-defense, I would probably help hide the bodies. Yeah. He said uh, can you see that a bit closer to the lapel? <laughs> basically, because he believes that she had a good reason to do it, then he's perfectly willing to help her. So they take all of the body's parts to a secure location where no one would find them. They bury them together. They have a great time doing it. Um, really team building exercise. Yeah. Leon is uh, a little too familiar with 
bearing bodies. <laughs> yeah, they all, they all use their special uh, skills to do it. The Hachi digs a hole. He's great at digging. Uh, Neon <laughs> knows dog. how to handle it. He's great at digging. <laughs> I was going to be like, did he talk to the hole? <laughs> did he convince the dirt to part? That, that is what... <laughs> Was Reina goes Moses. home, and her dad is still worried that Tepe will return. And Reina's basically like, I wish I could tell him that he won't, but, you know, this will just have to let him figure it out on his own eventually. She feels a throbbing in her wrist where Keiichi grabbed her earlier, and she starts to feel a little bit out of touch with reality. She chalks it up to, well, I just had a bad day. So that's probably all it is. Day 12, Oishi is investigating Tomitake's death and Takano's disappearance. So exactly right then, but basically together at uh, Watanagashi after watching the kids for a little bit, because of course he's suspicious of the Sonazakis. Later, Oishi talked to Reina at the school to ask about Tomitake's disappearance because the kids together signed his shirt, I believe, Yes. And he wants to ask her as a witness what she saw. We it, don't hear a lot of their conversation, I believe. Right. It's a, a lot of this kind of thing or, or a lot of this stuff is kind of glossed over because it is that's a, that's something that maybe we should have said early on. Um, uh, this uh, arc five was more was a uh, answer arc to Watanagashi, uh, to Watanagashi, which was arc two. Um, which was Mion's uh, question arc. Th this is a Onikakshi answer arc, which is uh, arc one. So this is more uh, basically following the events of arc one. And a lot of it, especially like the stuff that happened at the festival was just completely like, they just glossed over it entirely. It, it literally just kind of did like a fast forward through all of the events that happened there. So anyway. Straight to the CSI section. Yes. Yeah, this one's, like, really different uh, as an answer art compared to Miyakashi, too. Like, yeah. that one seems like a straightforward compliment. This is, like, a little... This differs in a pretty big way. Yeah, and we'll we'll get to that momentarily. <laughs> yeah. So, day 13, after her meeting with Oishi, where he asked about Takano, she thinks about the last time that she saw Takano. She met her in a library, and Takano said, Hey, I've got this scrapbook here with a ton of information about what I've researched in Hinamizawa. You ever hear about this oyashiro sama I think that there's people that are trying to use the supposed curse to gain political power and basically explains her cult theory that the powerful families in the town, in the village, are using it as a cover to bring back parasites and cover it up as a supernatural phenomena to make people believe in the old ways of Onigafuchi again. Uh, Reina opens up about her past experiences with Oyashiro-sama, explaining how she had been driven to self-harm and bad brain times in her time away. And when things got particularly bad, after already being hospitalized at one point, she was just scratching her arms, her wrists, her neck open because she saw maggots coming out of her. And they wanted to go back in, so she just had to keep scratching and pulling them out. And then she saw Oyashiro-sama, who apologized to her and said that if she returns to the village, the curse will go away. She, Takano asked Reina to keep the scrapbooks a secret because it might put them in danger if someone were to, someone were to find out. Day 14 is her reading the scrapbook in more detail. It talks about homesickness, uh, homing instincts, people and animals just feeling awful if they go too far from their nests, basically, and parasites, talking about how there may be a parasite that is controlling people that only can exist within the climate of Kinomizawa and has a homing instinct that disrupts them if they go too far away. Um, let me see here. He sees something about the maggot symptoms and wonders if the curse of Oyashiro-sama is a parasite. This day ends with o Oishi contacting Reina, pretending to be from the bookstore. So he's not being open with her dad about what he's contacting her. 
day 15, Reyna's been missing from class again. Keiichi goes on an errand and comes across her hiding in the bushes. She tells him that she thinks people have been following her, or following her in a white van. She thinks it's suspicious that they're going there, that she's seen them so many times. She tells him about the scrapbooks and thinks that Takana was murdered for knowing too much. Uh, Reyna thinks that the three families, especially the Sonozakis, might be using the parasites under the guise of the curse of Oyashiro-sama to regain control and return to the old ways. Sorry, uh, just checking something. No worries. Uh, Keiichi doesn't believe her, but he keeps it to himself. Stop echoing this. Um, after they part ways, Keiichi runs into the white van and they ask him if he saw a girl. And he thinks, hmm, weird. Maybe she's right, actually. Mm -hmm. Later that night, uh, well, day 16, he calls her and he says, I didn't believe you earlier, but now I think I do. She goes into more depth, basically explaining the uh, logic of the parasite theory, thinking that maybe it was that a long time ago, parasites formed from the swamp and infected people and a, a doctor, possibly from a foreign land, came to help them treat it. People at the time interpreted the parasites as demons from the swamp or turning people into demons. And Oyashiro-sama making peace between the demons and the humans was them finding a way to basically quarantine the village and treat the symptoms. Uh, if I'm wrong about this, or if anything's incorrect, by the way, just people pop in and correct. Sure. Um, so he, she explains that to him, and he goes, that actually makes a lot of sense. She also says that she thinks the Sonozakis are the ones basically maintaining the cult of Oyashiro-sama, using it as a political move to regain power along with the other three families, or the other two families to make up great three families. So as a result, she doesn't think that Mion can necessarily be trusted because she is the next heir. And even if she is their friend, she might be in on it. So she asked him to keep it quiet, basically. So he talks to me on the next day, laying everything out, uh, basically paraphrasing it in a way that is completely not nearly as in-depth as Reyna said it, making it sound crazy. So she's like, uh, that sounds crazy. And he's like, oh my God, you're right. No, that is crazy. So he stops believing in it. And, uh... Mion explains that the Sonozaki family is a habit of taking credit for things they didn't necessarily do because it helps maintain order and it makes them seem more powerful. She says that basically the kidnapping wasn't actually uh, the kidnapping of the construction minister's grandson or the minister of something's grandson during the dam conflict that they didn't. She says that they didn't actually do that, but they took credit for it because it made them look powerful. Um, let me see here. Uh, okay. The men in the white van appear at the school and they say, Hey, we're from Okanogi. We're from Okanogi gardens. We're here to take care of the lawns. He's like, Oh my God, that's what they were. They're just gardeners. They go to talk to Chie, uh, basically give her an invoice for their services. And Reina, who is watching from afar goes, Oh my fucking God, Chie is in on it. So she memorizes the number on the envelope of the invoice they give to Chie. She sneaks in and calls from the school phone to check the number. That number does not connect. <sighs> Afterward, we see a scene where Chie says, hey, there's a different number on this invoice and on the envelope. Which one's right? They say, oh, it's not the one on the envelope. It's the one inside. The one on the envelope is an old number. It doesn't work anymore. Dun, dun, dun. So at this point, Rena says, I can't trust any of this. I have to go hide. I have to go run into the forest, take as much food as I can, and just go. I'm going to the junkyard. So she goes to her home, takes everything she can, basically just ransacks the place, doesn't clean it up, leaves the front door open, gets out of it. Her dad comes home and says, uh, okay, definitely looks like Tepe's been in here. I'm going to call the cops about this. 
Also, Rena's missing, and so is her bike. Meanwhile, Rena checks on the body parts. They're not there anymore. So she thinks that because it had to be one of the people that were there burying it, who else would know about it? She assumes, well, clearly, Mion and her family dug it up and they're going to use it against me because I know too much. This is insurance if I try to do anything. That is what Reyna thinks. Uh, Meanwhile, um, yeah, the police is checking out the house. Uh, Reyna go goes home. She sees the police and goes, clearly, Mion sent this dude because they're trying to get me. Rena in ni day 19, there's 26 days of this, by the way. There's just so much to get through. I am so sorry this is taking so long. No worries. Rena calls Oishi, basically lays down what she has so far. Oishi tells her that the Sonozaki family is looking for her. Rena tells Oishi about the scrapbooks after kind of hesitating for a moment and her theory about Sonozaki family's involvement in the curse of Oyashiro Sama. Oishi tells Rena that Takano's body was ruled to already be dead 24 hours by the time it was found, the night of the festival. So, uh, after that conversation, Oishi decides to put Reina under pro police protection, and he is then told that she's missing. Um, we then see a phone call between Mion and Keiichi, where Mion says that she did, in fact, move the body parts to protect Reina, so the police wouldn't be able to find her or get her connected to it. Mion comes up with an alibi for Reyna to explain her disappearance and throw off the cops by giving them a false location. She is also trying to find Reyna before the cops do, hence why the family is looking for her. Mm -hmm. uh, day 20, the Sonozakis search for Reyna in the junkyard. She's hiding. She doesn't want anyone to find her. Rika comes by the junkyard, comes up to the door of the sedan and says, Hey, what's up? I'm a hundred years old. I got a syringe here. I can't inject you with it. Just do it yourself. <laughs> Re Re Rena obviously says, the most reasonable assumption here is that you're an imposter alien. You are sus imposter. 1000%. She thinks that the drug in the syringe will make her tear her throat out like Tomitaki did. Rika says, no, that was a different drug. Anyway, I don't care about you anymore. I only care about the next Reyna. Peace, I'm out of here. Reyna realizes that she's itchy and covered in blood and thinks someone must have secretly drugged her. Day 21, same night, but you know, structure. Keiichi tries to bring food to Reyna because he's worried about his friend. They meet. Reyna tells him, someone must have drugged me. I think it was Mion when we shared that omelet. Keiichi tries to explain to her that he doesn't think that's the case. He also tells them that, that they think the police suspect her in the murder. That's why the cops were there, clearly. He tries to convince Reyna that Mion didn't sell her out. Mion counters with parasites. Also, the parasites are actually aliens. So he, she's having a hard time believing anyone. She also says that, Kichi, you're not really my friend because you kept secrets about your past and friends don't keep secrets from each other. You shot children with a BB gun. What the fuck? So there's a little bit on that about how he used to shoot people walking down the street with a BB gun to kind of unwind from school stress it got a little bit out of hand. He may have really messed up a kid's eye. He realized how fucked up that was, turned himself in, and they had to basically pay off the cops or handle it with a lot of money, then move for his sake. Day, tw day 22, he decides to confess to his friends because, yeah, he feels real bad about that. And he doesn't like that he kept that a secret from Rena and his friends. Their response to that is, why did you tell us that? We didn't need to know that. 
TMI, dude. TMI. We don't care if you shot kids with a gun before. You're normal now. I'm joking. But basically, they're saying, you've already confessed to your sins. You've already tried to atone. You don't need to keep confessing. Satoko says, what's the point of living if we can't earn redemption? I believe that was. Yes. One thousand. Hey, have you heard about this thing called friends? We'd like to explain it to you. They tell him to stop trauma dumping, basically. Yes, basically. <laughs> and this is the one Keiichi, situation where that actually kind of... Yes, okay. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keiichi then remembers the events of Oni Kakushi. He remembers changing, becoming paranoid, not trusting his friends, and killing his friends. This is huge. Rika, this is huge. Yeah. We'll get to Rika it. Rika tells but... him that remembering his sin is a miracle and that she was wrong to give up on Reina. Keiichi, feeling awful about murdering his friend, apologizes to Mion, who doesn't really understand what he's talking about. And then he also realizes that he is possibly the only person that can really understand what Reina's going through, and he wants to stop her before she does what he did. Mion having quite a time of it. <laughs> yeah. Also, thank you uh, for the follow, Venice 12. Hi, how you doing? Day 23, Oishi, the police, his whole faction, and the Sonozakis meet. Basically, the Sonozakis say, this is all a misunderstanding. We don't need to worry about this. She hasn't done anything. Here, we have these scrapbooks. We're going to give them to you. And as you can see, they're nonsense. They're talking about aliens. They're talking about the underworld. They're talking about deep sea creatures. What Reina has is not something that is top confidential that anyone would try to hurt her for. They go back and forth. Oishi and the police cancel the raids they were going to do. And they negotiate terms of finding Reina safely and communicating with each other to try to both supposedly look out for her sake. That they just want her to go home and for this all to be dealt with. They smooth the whole situation over. Um, let me see here. Meanwhile, uh, Rena visits Keiichi's house, and she's gotten worse. Her text is redder. It has gotten quite red. That's the thing that we haven't been kind of yeah. uh, talking about. We should mention that. Yeah, yeah. Rena's text, like originally when we kind when the narrative switches from uh, Keiichi to Rena, her text is like pink, like light pink uh, originally, uh, and it's purplish pink, I'd say. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then it just keeps getting darker and darker and darker until at a certain point, it's so red, it's almost hard to read. Like it, the, the vibrancy of it. Like if you put that into Photoshop, Photoshop will tell you, we'll have a little alert, a little exclamation mark saying, don't put this on screens. It's way too vibrant. It'll hurt people's eyes. So. Yeah. Uh, also someone in the uh, stream chat reminded me, he also remembers that a lot of what he thought was hostile and them trying to attack him was possibly just a hallucination and that they were only trying to do a little prank on him, put a little bit of silly stuff in his food, not needles. And he just cruelly threw it on the ground when they were trying to look out for him. They were trying to visit him, trying to look after him. And he, uh, you know, murdered them about it. Yeah, and like the, the uh, syringe that he thought they were injecting him was uh, a marker. Apparently. Yeah, that they were just going to write that on, like, get well okay. soon on his shirt. Okay. And I, he, I don't know about for when they're talking about we're going to do to you what we did to Tomitake san, basically. Yeah. Because they know also about wrote all... on his shirt. Sorry, this also, Kickstarter I, is making me I, gassy. But, um, real quick, I don't know about all that. Um, we'll talk about it later, but, uh, I, mm, I don't, uh, I don't know about that. But you are totally correct for pointing out that he is remembering, like, the specifics of that and i when we get to the section about the new people who just went through this there is one very very powerful statement that khe remembers that isn't mm -hmm. actually um talked about in arc one that just fuck it, it bowled me over but anyway uh go ahead let's keep going i believe he also mentions that as he was trying to kill reyna she had her arms out and trying to show that she trusted. Okay, that was literally it. Yes, <laughs> that's it. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about it, but fuck, fuck. Yeah. So day twenty-three. Sorry, she's visiting the house. 
her condition's worse. She's been scratching at herself. I believe, is it able to get her band-aids on? Um, but they're, he's just trying to talk with her to smooth things over, to be like, you know, it's, it's okay. She says, actually, I was wrong to distrust you. I also have secrets in my past. He says, I actually already knew about that and I didn't care. Like, I didn't want to make a deal about it because you're my friend and I didn't know you then. I know you now. You're a good person right now. And that's well, all I care about. Specifically, I, so, I think that's not entirely true because he, his reaction was, his first reaction, his initial reaction was that he was scared of her. Um, yes, and, you're right. And he hates himself for feeling that. And then he yes. launches into what you were saying, which was basically that, you know, he's, he, you, it, it has no, I feel ashamed because it has no bearing on who you are right yes. now. So, yeah, there are, there are I, some nuances which are not, not important that I'm kind of glossing over here just because of the sheer amount of information. So I'm sorry. If anything gets lost, that is actually important. There is one thing I wanted to mention. It's not necessarily important, but I, one of the reasons I love Rena. Uh, it's mentioned that even while her neck is like bleeding, she's still covering it in like mascot band aids, and I'm like, I fucking love you, Renda, yeah, so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We were talking about that when we were watching the anime. Oh, go ahead. Who was talking? Yawn. I was just saying that there's also a crossover with her in Hello Kitty, which is certainly makes Aww. it feel a certain way. Oh, she totally had Hello. Kitty. Oh man, yeah. Um, we were talking. We were actually watching uh, on my uh, Discord. We were, uh, a bunch of us were watching the the anime, the uh, Higurashi anime, and her, of the anime he found in a junkyard. Yeah, it was, it was just laying there. I didn't pay for it or anything. Um, certainly not paying a hundred bucks for like a, a fucking arc of that god awful shit. Anyway, hey, um, no, no, that's for the Yumineko adaptation. I believe they oh, were right. somewhat okay. more reasonable prices for Higurashi. Is the you know, like. 13 bucks, I okay. believe, for the entire thing. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I got them mixed up. Is, it was um, is the Umineko, Umineko where it was like $90 for two episodes. Got uh, Yeah, I got them mixed up. Did, was Is the Umineko like, anime worth checking out? Or is Not at it, all. It is markedly worse. It is hilarious. I, I did but it's not very good. good. I, I did want to add though that those prices aren't uncommon for the Blu-ray releases. Like if you look at uh, any, that kind of stuff, like I, um, I, I believe I that they paid for that before um, for an anime I really really liked, but they also include like a bunch of other things. Whereas in America, they only release like the full season in a single box. I believe that like even by those standards, it was seen as like ridiculously expensive for whatever reason. Like like I, I know I, that um. I know that that year, that year, 2chan voted it like the worst anime of the year. In large part, it was because of how they released it in hard copy being ridiculous. Like, and I, I that that is definitely a part of it. But like, the, that's not actually that unusual of a price. It's more that they just had almost nothing outside of like the sexy women on the covers. And people wonder why they pirate shit. Anyway, so. Keiichi says, you're my friend. I'm going to believe in you. I trust you. I love you. Let's try to make this work. He says that he'll help her, I think, in a certain way, not like literally be her accomplice or anything, but like he's he wants to help fix things. And she says, okay, I've got a come from behind plan. I'm going to do it tomorrow to get ahead of the day of revival before they can pull off their big plan. Everything's going to end tomorrow. He says, cool. Awesome. Day 24, um, Mion and Keiichi both talk about this. They say, we're going to believe in her. Mion says, I've got some stuff lined up to make sure that everything's going to be safe. I've got some bodyguards. I'm going to believe in her. Even if she tries to attack me, I'll be fine. Because she's my friend. Famous so last she's got words. some bodyguards stationed outside the school. And uh, let's see here. When they go to the school, they smell weird stuff. Kind of smells like gasoline and there's a ball missing. Don't know what that's about. Did they specifically say that it smelled like gasoline early on? I, I, I want to so. say they I think did. They yes. did. Okay. Yeah. All right. They do. And they blame it on the um, gardeners outside because they're like, oh, the gardeners must have like filled up next to the window or that, something. Uh, the forestry yeah. service. Yeah. Legitimately. Yes. Whenever I yeah. mowed with my old lawnmower, the gas powered lawnmower, I would come back smelling completely like gasoline. So understandable. 
Continue yeah, on. and it is the forestry building technically before a school. So they're like, yeah, I guess. Sure. And there's also those juniper leaves and branches they had before. It happens. Yep. So Mion goes to call Kasai and check in. Uh, she's a little bit loud with her conversation. <laughs> Chie is right there. Chie Sensei. She's like, uh, hey. <laughs> so she's like, oh, uh, just talking about Reina. You know, we're just, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, just going to take care of it. Everything's fine, Sensei. Don't worry. I'm out of here. As she leaves, Chie Sensei gets a call. And uh, it's, it's Reina. Reina wants to talk to her. So Chie grabs her keys, gets out of there. Mion goes, oh, okay, he bodyguards. Go after her, make sure she's safe. I trust Reina, but she might be having a bad time, so make sure that Chie is safe. So the bodyguards leave. Um, and then Reina's taking hostages in the classroom. This is where shit hits the fucking fan. Um, yeah, this, we are I, now I, at day 25 out of yeah. six. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it finish. I'm just gonna say, this is, to me, perhaps the scariest fucking thing in all of Higurashi, because it's very, very real. Yeah, it, it's... Yeah. Like, we'll, we'll get to it, we'll, we'll talk after, but this is legitimately, yeah. like... Yeah, I don't want to interrupt you on anymore, but... Yeah, yeah no, it, I, it, it just, it, it's good to stress that this was very stressful to read <laughs> and uh yeah, it's, it's very intense it's very intense and, and i think it's very intense because it's entirely believable um this whole thing is played off and i i don't know as an american you know violence in a in a classroom is kind of you know a thing that we deal with um a lot yeah, to, yeah. Uh, I said I said get into it uh, a bit. Um, Kyoani, uh, the Kyoani, yeah, I was about uh, to mention that, that yeah. was very similar in that, that someone bought a shit ton of that gasoline. But we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Go ahead. Yeah. Man. So, um, <clears throat> Reina takes the class hostage. Uh, she has Heichi help tie them up with jump ropes. She calls Oishi and the police in. And basically explains that she took the hostages to speed up their investigation so that they understand how important this is. She wants them to do their raids, to find evidence, to find their secret research location where they're making their parasites. She wants them to get the antidote and bring it to her. So um, she has Heichi bring down the scrapbooks to Oishi so that they understand exactly how important this is and what's happening. He gives him the scrapbooks. There's a note inside. Oishi gives Keiichi, in the VN, or sound novel, a police baton, in addition to spray pe uh, pepper spray and a radio with an earpiece. What? He doesn't use the baton. He got a baton? I don't remember that. That's, that's what it said, at least, but he never actually use it so i'm not sure what that is about yeah, um, weird. i only remember the earpiece and the the mace but eh. yeah that was in wrong. the anime but they didn't have the baton so i guess they just figured i thought that was know. a sound novel too yeah whatever anyway continue anyway yeah so he goes back up the uh radio is listening to everything so that the police can hear what's going on when he goes back up there the room is doused in gasoline the Kids are doused in gasoline. Reina has moved all of them to one corner. The police look at the note, which explains the alien theory. She says, sorry, I didn't tell you this before. I didn't think you would believe me. But anyway, there's a deadline of 7 p.m. If you don't get me this and the antidote, I'm going to blow up this school. I've got a backup bomb, and I know how gasoline fumes work. So I will blow this entire thing up with myself if you don't do it. So she also it attacks Mion with the handle of her hatchet or whatever you want to call it, cleaver, several other names. And she's very upset because she's, she's talking about, I liked you so much. She is Daisuke. She talked about how much she liked her and how much it hurts her that she betrayed her. And Mion is got a bike lock around her neck she can't move her hands she can't protect her face it's fuck, it's fucking brutal wailing yeah. on her 
Keiichi tries to convince Reina that Mion was helping her. That she's like, we gave you an alibi because we care about you. For a second, everyone, please cover your ears and forget what I'm about to say. We moved the body parts because we were trying to help you. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, so I wasn't going to interrupt. I, there's a conversation here that's very important where they explain the potency of the gasoline and basically say yes. a single spark is enough to blow up the entire school. And like, uh, Rena is holding a lighter lighter yes yes she and, is. sorry and it's sorry i just want to mention that they do mention that uh keiji's receiver like the receiver got from uishi yep. uh has enough electrical current to set it off yep. like a spark from yes. that would be enough so i think they even talk turn it off i think they even talk about um and and this is good for people who don't know this um the spark from static electricity is enough mm -hmm. to ignite um the gasoline so fyi uh, that's why a lot of the time uh, at gas pumps, um, you you know, stat like gas pumps will um, catch on fire more in the winter because of static electricity. Mm -hmm. So know that uh, going in, try uh, discharge your your um, uh, discharge on a piece of metal. Like usually when you open up your car, the the um, gas the 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 gas. Uh, whatever it's called. If you do any PC building, just do the same shit you do with your PC case. L literally, yes. Exactly. Yes. And then, you know, uh, discharge and then uh, pump your gas. But anyway. Or she also wonders why anyone is allowed to have access to such a yes. dangerous liquid. Yeah. <laughs> it's... It, I, he's uh, not wrong. He's not wrong. Uh, I, I, sorry, I, I keep getting sidetracked and I don't want to do that, but I just want to say that I really like Oishi in this part because after he gets humbled it feels like he just thinks things through a lot more and he's like man a lot of shit stupid <laughs> uh this, this you, go ahead you can mention a lot of these once yon is done with the summer sorry like the sorry I, I, like, no, I, sorry i sorry. really i just really want yon to be able to get through this yeah sorry sorry Thank you, Gail. it's okay i'm everything's cool yeah, it's just, th Thank this you. is the whole reason that we were trying to come up with this. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't mean to be It's, it's all good. Not. I've been talking for 40 minutes already. Goodness. I'm, I'm almost sorry. done. Um, So, uh, Keiichi, in an attempt to try to get her to calm down and stop attacking their friend, he's like, hey, I've been there. I also attacked her in another world, another whatever you want to call it. I understand you're going to hate yourself later when you remember this. You don't need to do this. This isn't you. This is something changing you. And you don't have to do this. I know you. You're a good person. You would die for your friends. You died because you trusted me. And I'm going to try to trust you now. He tries really hard. He says, look, you know, I'll even hold my arms out so you can attack me all you want. And I won't defend myself. Day 26. Again, same day. Higher-ups from the prefectural headquarters take over. There's the chief of police that's there. They're like, okay, we're going to take over this stuff. You're down to backup now. So Oishi is like, hey, Keiichi, uh, you've got like five minutes. Can you defuse a bomb for me? There's another bomb in there. So he comes up with a... So, uh, hold on a second. Yeah, I think uh, there's a bit where he has Rena leave the classroom to tell him that. Anyway, sorry. So he comes up with an excuse to leave the class. He says, hey, Reina, you hear that? I heard a noise outside. What, what's that about? She says, okay, you go check that. He leaves and he goes to try to find the bomb. Um, actually, was there already a bit about? I'm, I'm sorry. While Reina was out of the room, he discussed the situation with Satoko and Rika. They try to figure out where the bomb might be. Sorry about that. Um... Also, sorry if my mic is messing up again. Does it sound okay? Yeah, sounds fine. Okay, cool. Um, so I was hearing some echoing on my side. Um, so, uh, let me see here. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I don't know. I didn't see that in my notes about them talking about the bomb. Anyway, so the, head, the, the people come. They take over the investigation. H.G. leaves to go find the bomb after making the excuse. He finds a decoy bomb, which Reyna had set up kind of as a trap to see if he was going to betray her. He finds it. He goes, oh, no, this is fake. And then she's behind him. 
she's about to attack him, but Rika attacks her from behind, manages to get the lighter out of her hand. So he takes the lighter. He allows Rika to handle her because he trusts her. He says, this is what I should do right now. Have faith in my friend. So he gets out of there. Um, Satoko helps slow Reina down with the trap. Very quick trap setting up there. He decides to go check the other place, which is the roof, where the bomb might also be. He gets up there. Um, let me see here. Reina follows him up there. They have a face-off. Not like the movie, but with weapons. So they fight. She's got her... Uh, oh, I should have wrote this. Satoko gave Keiichi her brother's bat. So he's got that. He's got his metal bat versus her cleaver. They're on the roof. They're fighting. They get really caught up in it. Oh, he defused the bomb, by the way. God damn it. I am really falling apart in the synopsis here. He found the bomb, defused it. Then they face off. I don't know why I'm having a hard time reading my own notes right now. They fight. They're having a good time fighting. In fact, they are fighting for so long that the sun goes down. They're just like, I love this. I don't even care about the gasoline anymore. I don't even care about the aliens anymore. Because he defeats the bomb, the other kids are out. They're safe. And they're just still fighting out there. They are just going at it. They're like, hey, when I win, you have to be my maid. No, when I win, you don't have to be my maid, actually. In fact, I'd prefer it if I didn't have to die at all. I'd prefer it if you didn't have to kill me. I'd prefer it if I won, that we could just be friends and hang out and you'd say hello to me every morning and every evening. That sounds a lot more fun than dying, actually, now that I think about it. So, she knocks the bat out of his hand. She's got the cleaver raised up, ready to bring it down on him. And Reyna says, I don't want to do this, actually. This sucks. You're my friend. So, they embrace. She's crying. And Keiichi says, hey, audience, we averted the tragedy. The end roll comes, says that all of the, you know, the, the main kids, they're out there. They just sustained light injuries. Reina is being detained for her trial. They're trying to figure out whether or not they should, you know, handle her as being like uh, being held accountable for her actions due to her mental state. We get post-game tips, one of which is Akasaka visiting Kinamizawa 20 years later. They said that it was destroyed in one night by gas. Volcanic gas from the swamp, I believe. Or some fault or some opening. They drained the swamp entirely, filled it with concrete. Akasaka is meeting with military men, and they discuss file number 34, which basically surfaced afterwards, was spread across the internet, if I remember correctly. Basically saying the destruction was a cover-up. Saying that it's suspicious how long the village was closed off after the, the gas destroyed everything. It's suspicious because other other times that that happened in other places, it was not closed off for so long. There's discussion of Reina acquiring the scrapbook from Takano just before she died and saying, hey, that's suspicious too. Also, weird that the military personnel were getting checked for possible infections. The staff uh, staff room, basically, among other things, has Ryukishi saying, look, if you're in a bad situation, you don't have to do violence. You don't have to do that. There's hotlines, there's people that can help you. That's the end of my synopsis. My throat hurts. Woo. <laughs> Treat cheers for um, Clapping. Thank you. I hope I did a good job. You did. Yeah. Sorry for falling apart yeah. at the end there. You no, did a wonderful no. job. You did a wonderful great. job. It's very, very good. You. Thank you. It was very, Thank very you. Common. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, okay, and uh, with that, um, 
I guess we're moving on to the first timer reactions, impressions uh, section. And theories, yeah. And theories. Oh boy. And theories. Oh God. Well, my UFO theory went up in flames. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, at one point, I made a joke in our ch in our Higurashi chat, the original DM about maybe possibly like oh uh, like is it UFOs? And y'all like pinned it as a, and I was like that's interesting. Why did they pin that? And now because I know why. Because it was why. funny. Haha. -ha. <laughs> And now, uh -huh. now it's even more funny. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, go through. All right, um, so who are my fellow first-time enjoyers of Igarashi? It's Talzreal and who else? Uh, this was the first time I read it. Arp. Okay. Uh, and anyone else? Okay. So I guess it's just the three of us. Um, yeah. Whoever who wants to go first uh, and just talk about like. You know, uh, first impressions, uh, big moments, um, theories, anything like that. I'm incredibly happy that Murder Bear stopped me from watching the intro. Uh, so I was not spoiled that this chapter was going to end with a fight between Keiichi with a bat and Reyna with a hatchet. I was. I got Bob, spoiled. It tells you that it spoils it. It tells you. It's really sad. I thought it was like, uh, when I first saw that, I thought it was like a, um, also, thank you, uh, Link Attack 21 for the hydrate um although you can't really this is like the opposite of hydration so anyway um yeah i thought it was like metaphorical or something i was like oh that's interesting surely they're not going to have like a samurai battle on top of a building somewhere little did i know you um, fool you fool um also uh something that wasn't really brought up uh in these at all because um as jan said uh, uh they like skipped over um, the, 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 what do they call them? The notes? I forget what they call them. Why did I just forget? The, what? Tips. the tips. The tips. I don't, I forgot why, uh, whatever. Uh, there was a tip, uh, particularly that the intro, um, uh, spoiled, which was Rika drinking wine at the window. And then a bunch of this mysterious girl with horns. Oh. And it was like, she was shown like transparent. And I'm immediately like, oh, so that's the, that's the, that's the footstep person. This is the girl that we're hearing when, um, you know, people are infected and she's like walking around with them. Um, or at least that's kind of what I'm thinking. But anyway, uh, she, uh, Rika said her name in arc five. Um, I think when she was dying, I, I forget her name. Um, uh, I, for, I forget her name. Uh, and no one's going to help me out with that because I guess it's a spoiler. Um, nah. <laughs> no. I can't say that I remember that, but maybe I'll have to look at that again after we're done. Here, I'll open up. Uh, let me see if I got my notes. Okay, uh, while I do that, Arp, uh, you want to keep going? Uh, it was really cool. I do have a question. Uh, did anyone else read the bad endings? No. Because they're really bad. Like, bad as in, like, what happened in them is terrible, or, like, bad as in, like, it's it's shit? Poorly written. Okay. So, uh, it, yeah, tell us. Uh, so the first one is... Uh, uh, you have the choice when Mion goes to call and talk to uh, Kasai. You can go with her, or you can stay in the classroom. If you go with her, when Rena calls the teacher, he runs out and goes with the bodyguards. And we see that Chie went to the shrine where the bridge where he got shoved off of in part three. And they realized, oh, fuck, Rena tricked us. And he's the one who figures out where Rena is. They rush back, but Rena's already taken everyone hostage and covered the area in gasoline. But because he wasn't inside with her at the time, she doesn't give him the note that lets... Or uh, doesn't give him the note, so he never gets the earpiece. So he can never tell people that everything's coated in gasoline. So when the especially dumbass dumbass cops show up, uh, they decide to breach and clear, and they destroy the uh, the school, and everyone dies. And Keiichi goes over there to like see if there's any survivors, and he finds Mion, and then he discovers Mion is dismembered as her body parts start rolling around in a very silly described way. Jesus, what the fuck. Uh, did Studio the other bad Dean end write that? Is, 
the other bad end is when uh, Keiji discovers uh, the fake bomb. You have a choice of something you yell to Sadako, and one of them is the correct one where you run off and find the bomb. The other one isn't, I guess, and uh, she hasn't figured out where the bomb is, so the bomb goes off and everyone dies. Rip. Rip to all the real ones. That sucks. I said this to Arp. I don't understand the point of bad endings in a series that is all bad endings. Like, yeah, it's yeah. like I can understand it if, like, oh, let's. This is really fascinating um, because uh, because the the core of Higarashi is so interesting, and it can be done as a video game, um, in my mind. Like you can do a um, a Disco Elysium esque version of this, where it's all trying to get to a good end, but part of it is getting to the bad end, and then restarting, and then having the new like timelines kind of blend together in new interesting ways, and figuring out okay who's infected this time, uh, where you know what characters are interacting with each other. Who did Takano share a fucking crazy person uh, uh, notebook with in this one? So that you got to worry about them anyway. Hanyu is the name of the the person that Rika was talking to, I believe. Hanyu was the name that Rika said while she was dying in Arc Five. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna assume that's Hanyu. But anyway. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting because like it is very game video game esque, but also I find it extremely funny because it almost directly contradicts like the the tips from Arc. What was it Arc Five, where Ryukishi 07 is basically saying like, look, I'm writing this in a specific way. People who want different art, uh, different options and stuff like that's not what I'm about. That's not what this is about. Um, it's kind of dumb. Here, here, here's my jokey version uh, that make that kind of makes fun of the idea of putting options and like multiple choice paths in this game, and then to simultaneously have the the fucking console version do the multiple choice thing is just such. It's a, it's really a misread. It's like it's like if it's like if a company who did a really terrible version of Silent Hill 2 was suddenly remaking Silent Hill 2 anyway. I digress. Crazy. Uh, did did you all talk about Arc 5's bad endings? I unfortunately had to miss the large chunk of that discussion. No. no. Uh, I, you know, um, the, the only sort of console bad ending stuff that we talked about is I had a good long rant about uh, Tsuki Otoshi, uh, which is Arc 3's bad ending thing or whatever. I had a big long rant about that one in that stream and that's about it. Ah, uh, so do people want to hear Arc 5's uh, stupid bad ending? Go for it. Sure, shoot. So it's when uh, Keiichi's being tortured, uh, you can make the choice and figure, and he figures out that it's uh, uh, Shion and not me on who's torturing him. Uh, it turns out that in this version, he did give me on the doll but that made Shion super jealous, so everything happened anyways. Uh, but because he figures out that Shion, she doesn't kill him, the cops get there and she runs away, so everyone survives. Uh, everyone KG, survives? Yeah. Uh, and then KG and Bion go on a date in Tokyo, and Damn. she goes off to use the restroom, <laughs> and he's sitting on a bench, and a guy walks up and shoots him in the head. Uh, what the fuck? Wait. Uh, so awesome. Shion didn't give get a chance to kill Satoko or no, Rika. The, oh, no, sorry, they, no, they're dead. Those they're two very are, dead. Okay, they're right. very dead. Sorry. I was like, uh, mm. <laughs> you're right. I for, yeah, sorry. No, th those two are still dead. But uh, Confirmed Ren and Beyond and KT are alive, and I think I can't remember what Shion did. <laughs> I think I think Shion j jumped down the well or something. Uh, um. Okay. But yeah, and then he's just sitting on a bench and a guy walks up and shoots him in the head. And then Mion comes back and there's a very bad CG with terrible perspective of his dead body laying on a bench. I've oh. noticed in the intros the CG is pretty fucking bad. 
CGs are horrible, but I, I have them on because they, yeah, Charmed they're them. funny. Okay. I, as somebody who played the game with no CGs originally, like going back and seeing CGs, I'm like, every scene is made worse by them. We should probably add that uh, this is the only chapter where in the original there is a CG. And mm -hmm. when Rena cries. When Rena mm -hmm. cries. It's the only yeah. CG in all of Higurash. Oh. Ah. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that uh, a bunch of the ending was actually accentuated because uh, I was flipping through the multiple... Uh, the, the fucking original art, the Ryukishi art with the mitten hands and Rena being like uh, fucking going nuts. But just holding that little cleaver that little hatchet uh, it's just so adorable it's like how can you be mad at her <laughs> like, but i noticed that all of like the the new the console art is actually extremely good in that moment because there are multiple um uh uh ways that rena is uh, her eyes looking at you you can tell when she's like sort of fully in her delusion, when she's not, when she's aggressive, when she's maybe a little bit more defensive, a lot of different ones of her holding the hatchet in different ways. And they used it really cool and really, uh, really um, well when she's actually like doing the, uh, doing the fight scene at the very end with Keiichi. Um, like, you know, doing quick hits and stuff with the hatchet and the slashing and stuff. It was very well done. I was actually surprised that, it, yeah, it, it was a lot more than I was expecting. And, you know, and that's for a good thing because that, what an ending. Wow. That, um, there's something I need to talk about with that ending, by the way, but we'll, we'll get to it. Um, all right. Uh, Tal's real. Uh, do you have anything? Oh, absolutely. Fuck. So, um, I guess the first thing I wanted to mention was, uh, just as a reaction, how the storyline, uh, subverted my expectations with some frequency mm. after we found out about Rena and make, and, uh, tricking Rena's dad into marrying him and all that. I figured that was how the entire arc was going to go. And no, she's dead. The next scene pretty much. Yeah. That really pops off pretty damn quick. Um, so there's that. Um, but uh, we, you mentioned uh, Rika drinking wine before, and I have certain thoughts about that because uh, that started uh, me leading to something, and I think I've connect. I've finally connected Miss Frederica Burncastle, who's been giving us poems all this time with someone actually in the storyline are you saying that so someone named frederica would maybe be rika well yeah yes in fact um that that's part of it but actually the um the evidence i held is uh from Burncastle's uh poem in arc three the snake in the well was happy for it did not care what was outside the well the snake in the well was happy, for it had naught to do with what happened outside the well. And you were happy too, for you did not know what happened outside the well. When Rika in old Rika mode confronts Reyna in the junkyard and says, Here's a syringe, it will cure you. When, um, when Reyna says, No, I'm not trusting anything, much less a syringe, she directly says, a frog sitting in a well doesn't need to have any interest in the world outside. So that line confirmed to me, at least, that the old Rain uh, personality with Rika is Frederica Burncastle. And it also kind of checks out that uh, the old Rika personality was the one drinking wine and looking at the stars and being all, well, poetic. So that matches with that. And it also is worth kind of going back to arc four where uh, in the scene where Rika threatens Akasaka about, hey, you should go back to Tokyo because if you don't go back to Tokyo, your, your wife will die. Although she didn't say all of those nice details. Um, when she said her piece, Rika trips and falls and meeps and is back to her young Rika personality. 
And he, seeing that the first time, I had the impression that Rika was resisting possession of some kind. That, Re, that young Rika was taking control back from the old Rika voice, or Burncastle, as I suspect. So it, it but all, we also see later, uh, back in arc six now, during the fight scene with Rena, uh, Reek is all, oh, I've I've faced death hundreds of times before. I'm not afraid of you. <clears throat> and Rain is all, oh, you're a clone. I'm where's the real Rika? And Rika's all, I'm right here. Me, me pa. And I kind of take that as Rika as young Rika personality being a separate entity. And she is there with Burncastle. And Burncastle's driving for the fight scene, but Rika, young Rika is on board with it is how I see it. Mm. See, I took that more as um, she's just acting. Like she is simultaneously old Rika and young Rika. It's just when the situation needs it, like she will slip into the young personality. Uh, hence the meep, nipa and like thing. But then also she, you know, is a, hundred at least a hundred years old quote unquote um you know uh with uh, what she's going through and so i think that that i don't think that there's a possession thing going on i could be wrong but um yeah i think that hanyu is a separate entity um and i think that rika <clears throat> is um excuse me is just really really old and they're both I don't know. Somehow, Hanyu's maybe giving her the ability to Groundhog's Day into like um, alternate realities and stuff, or whatever. Um, yeah, there was. Go ahead. There, there was another point I wanted to mention where during some of the tip scenes with Burncastle, uh, Burncastle was talking to I quote the annoying one. A, myst a mystery voice uh, that was uh, kind of coordinating with her on when she's going to die and how she's going to die. That's got to be um, on you. I mean, and uh, I I have a theory that that's possibly also on you, but um, I have the theory that the person she's talking to there is Oyashiro-sama because there's the, the, the conversation comes up that after she's seen Keiichi uh, remembering the events of Onikakshi, uh, the, uh, the annoying other voice says what Keiichi did was impossible. And Burncastle says, well, if you're the one saying that it's impossible, that can only make it a genuine miracle. And the way I read it would be that if... The, the way I read that line is that if a divine presence, if a god is saying that something is possible, the only thing that could beat that is a miracle. And that's the, why I would say that it's Oyashiro-sama, who might also be Hanyu, but I don't have any information about that. Yeah, I don't either. Um, that makes sense. Um, yeah, we. it's one of those things where I just, yeah, we don't have enough information at the moment. Um, and speaking of information, I, a couple other loose ends. Um, I mentioned on the Discord before, but um, we we tur when it turned out that Oni Kakashi was, um, I mean, we predicted that they were trying to help, but I at least was focused on the hallucination distorting uh, Mion's words instead of distorting the the quote-unquote syringe that was, according to this, actually a marker. But that act that is interesting in the context of the message Keiichi left on the clock. It was censored out with the with where he wrote about the syringe. But the, he was he attached the syringe air quotes to it, which would have just been you know a marker. And it's interesting that someone would have bothered to censor Keiichi's note if there was no real syringe to deal with. That's that's another thing. That's yeah. That's definitely we're getting in. We're, yeah, we're going real hard into the theory crafting stuff, and that's cool. Um, 
yeah, if we want to talk about that, like right now, we can we can do that. Um, I am of the opinion that um, it wasn't a marker. I think that uh, Keiichi is a dumbass and is constantly doing dumbass shit. Um, I'm kidding, but at the same time, like I think that he it. Mm, it could be. You think he's overcorrecting? Basically. I think yes. I think that he is not. He in his you know clear headed. In, he wasn't clear headed when this was going on. So it is important to that he remembers certain things happening. But I also think that I don't. I just don't. I don't think my gut is screaming that no. It was. It, it had to have been a syringe because. It make it makes way too much sense. It it would be real. It would be way more tragic um, if Mion was just trying to write something on his shirt, like it well soon. But like remembering the events of that and how basically Rena was helping him to his bed um, after he is he was losing his fucking mind and thinking that people, which that's another thing we got to talk about. The because was all of that stuff with the the people in the van hitting him. Was that his, I don't think that that was his, I think that they legitimately hit him and he flew into the, and into the mud and then yeah. he got fucked up by that. Like, Just to bring up a point, um, it does, uh, lend to it since, um, the note they found behind the clock did have a section torn out of it. Yeah. So, uh, but that, that's also interesting because. And now that you say that indestructible cat, I, I'm going back on me uh, on what I was thinking because you're you're trying to uh, mess with me. Um, so now I'm thinking that it was a marker and that it was ripped out of the note because it it had bearing on. Why do I keep forgetting his name? He's like the dude who dies in every arc. Tomitake. 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 So I think that maybe it was ripped out. Um, because of Tomitake's death, because I think, well, Rika basically confirmed it that, um, you know, the syringe that I'm giving you, Rena, is different from the syringe that was used to kill Tomitake. And I think it was ripped out because someone know, who knew about that situation, possibly Keiichi's parents, because who else knew about the, the clock, you know? Um, but anyway. Um, maybe the, it got ripped out specifically for that and that there was no syringe because here's the thing there was no needle it was just that the the mochi was um spicy specifically i think uh, i think it was uh in in the 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 translation i think it, it was like oh we made one mochi spicy but then uh in you can actually hear M mion's voice actress go um Tabasco, like they specifically say Tabasco sauce. So anyway, so yeah, they made it spicy and then he somehow interpreted that as, oh, there's a needle in here, threw it against the wall. There's nothing actually there. Um, yeah. It's also like, so I just like, if that seems weird, another thing to consider is, um, I know like the anime adaptation pretty much sort of like made clear visually that there was a needle or something like that. Like you see it. Or something like like I think that sort of runs a counter to um what the sound novel is doing as like what it's doing with the written word and stuff and like I think there's more ambiguity to it that is sort of like not accounted for when you're like seeing these things happen in a way. I think the that, needle's like a good example of that. Yeah, I was gonna say one of the things that I I actually mentioned this uh, to somebody before. I feel it's really hard to visually depict Tegarashi, especially on a Kakush, on a, especially the first part, because so much of it is you just like taking everything Keiichi says at face value. And if you go back and read it, he rarely ever speaks in absolutes. He's like, I th like that thing that she's pulling out of her pocket. I think it's a syringe, you know, that uh, he ne you never hear oh, she pulled a syringe out of her pocket, you know, all that. Uh, but you just have to trust that he is saying everything in absolutes. And I think that's one thing the anime struggles with is that it's depicting these things as real. 
Right. Um, and there are certain things, certain visual tricks that you can use to obfuscate, like exactly what is going on. I also think that when a when a, a, a um, when a shot is done in, in seemingly first person perspective, I think that that basically highlights um, subjectivity. Um, so if they had done something like that, that would have, to me, that would have been like, oh, interesting. That doesn't, you know, maybe what I'm seeing is suspect. But anyway, um, yeah. Uh, it could be either uh, it could go either way uh here's my question um that will heavily influence whether i keep going on this or not um did uh was keichi uh, seated with the idea for the um uh, for the the syringe did he hear someone talking about someone getting um injected with something at any point yes uh it, Oishi mentions that it, I believe Oishi mentions Oishi. That it might have been a drug uh, and that that really gets Keiichi thinking about the idea of you know like of drugs and a drug that could have caused people to do okay. this and whatnot. so it's it's most likely a marker then fuck yeah um, Which, well you know going back to uh, Rena's uh, Rena in this chapter, it's after Oishi starts talking to her that she starts going off the deep end as well. Right. Hmm. Yep. I mean, and it's it's funny because that's kind of uh, Oishi kind of talks about that uh, toward the end. Um, he I, I, he has a line I believe where he's basically like, "Damn, I thought I was just like being friendly and being casual by talking like this, but maybe I was actually like." divulging more than I should have and by being friendly and casual and kind of being open and honest with people I was accidentally uh, accidentally like making them paranoid or I was accidentally like um uh giving up too much I think something along those lines he he has reservations about how casual he he was talking with people at, at, at toward the end um so one thing uh I remember from, uh, or something put out to me from part three, is that after Uishi shows up in that, uh, Coach talks to uh, Keiichi, and he specifically says people start calling Uishi Oishiro-sama's uh, messenger because yeah. he talks to people, and then the curse happens. Yeah. And it's interesting. See, that's... That makes me think... Okay, um shit should we just all right i'm i'm actually going to backpedal a little bit and i'm going to talk about some of my things um that i wanted to talk about the big moments um that really hit me as a first time enjoyer of higarashi arc 6 the main one being uh the very beginning where um rena is described as trying her very best and i i love that so much i i love that so much i it's it's kind of obvious to people um, especially after I think it was arc three where Rena is Rena is clearly dealing with something. Rena clearly has something going on and uh, we just don't know. Um, and it's, it's just, it, it's, it's such a fantastic way of opening this. The, the way that this arc opens is so good. Like I can't describe it. <laughs> like It's so fucking powerful. It's so like, what the fuck is going on? Why, why is everyone here? Why is this? Why is, why is she hopping up here? She, she seems like she did something and I'm just like, what the fuck? What, what happened? Rena, tell me. Um, and then, you know, this is the story about how Rena Rigu, uh, tried her very best and it's just so fucking nice. It's just such, it's so nice. Anyway, um, so if anyone, uh, no one wants to uh, commentate on that, I will. Uh, it's so good. It's so it's, fucking good. It's so good. I was just gonna. Like just instantaneously, Arc Six became my favorite just from that opening. Yeah, I I love that opening so much because it. I think something I a word I would use to describe Arc Six is a lot of it feels cozy. It makes Hinamizawa feel really cozy, and. That really got to me because, A, so much of the prior arcs have really been about depicting it as this really, really dangerous place. You know, oh, you can't trust anybody around town, all that. It's like, no, no, you know, like, 
you can tr put your trust trust people but also because it's like it's contrasting it against like the stresses rena is going through the things in her mind and the very comfortable environments that she's set out to create you know even as she's confessing a crime you know i think that it this chapter does a very very um I, I forget who asked, but earlier on we had someone in the chat, um, in the stream chat, ask about the mental health angle of this arc. And I think that it's, I think that there are a couple things that slip up, but at the same time, like they're, they're corrected by the end. And then slap onto that, Ryukishi straight up saying, you know, incredibly powerful and meaningful words in the staff, uh, in the staff room um, section about how like, you know, if, um, you know, someone is trying to help you for free, they can't be a bad, a bad person. Like, you know, if you, so that stuff is super, super powerful. Um, go ahead. That thing, I, I was just, sorry, I'm gonna try to let people talk more, but I was just gonna say that, see, the very first thing I ever saw of Higurashi, the sound novel, was that staff room. Somebody posting the screen caption of the staff room and it hit me so hard that I was like, I need to read this series just to get to that point to like understand the context of this and learning the context of it made it hit so much harder. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 super super powerful and oh, I love Riyakishi. Riyakishi, Riyakishi if you're watching this, you aren't, but uh, I love you, man. Like you, that that's so fucking like to do all that to say all of this, to work on all of this and also be humble and like kind of make fun of yourself. Like the way that Ryukishi at the end of that, um, at the end of that note, at the end of the staff room saying like, yeah, uh, I wrote all of these words just to tell you this, spe this one message that you should seek help. You know, if, if you, if you, if you need it, if you want it. Like, and uh, you know, I'm an idiot because I, you know, it took me this long to do that. Like, that's so fucking, oh man. I just want to shake this man's hand. God damn it. I also feel that Ryukishi was poking fun at himself with all those references to the demon script because yes. he's the one authoring the thing in general. So he is the demon writing the script. Yeah, no, 1000%. Like there's a moment toward the end where, you know, uh, Keiichi is, is yelling basically to the stars to, oh, the, whoever wrote this really fucking sucks. <laughs> and <laughs> I imagine Ryukishi she like looking into the camera like at that moment <laughs> but anyway um but yeah speaking more about the mental health angle i think that this arc does a lot for um highlighting uh uh those who are struggling in silence those who um are dealing with things and, and don't who are dealing with incredibly deep uh difficult things who also feel like they can't talk to anybody who can't, they can't reach out to anybody. And I think this arc does a, does a lot for, because I'm, I'm susceptible to, you know, the, the, the struggling in silence aspect of a lot of media. And I, I, I kind of, you know, it's one of those things where if you can tell immediately when, um, when something's doing it wrong, uh, when it's doing it unempathetically, when it's trying to say like, oh, you know, something like, um, I don't know, just as a crazy example, um, you know, uh, you, you know, um, I, uh, should I even make the reference? So close. I, I could smell the $5 bill. All right. <laughs> um, you can't save everybody. Uh, there's something uh, as fucking <laughs> insane as that. Um, it's just, anyway, I won't, I won't keep going, but, um, uh, you know, really powerful media, um, uh, really impactful moments, um, in media are doing a lot of what arc six is doing, which is basically, you know, standing up or show is not only standing up, but like giving a voice to the, to the voiceless, like, to, like saying, Hey, we're all struggling with shit. Like we're trying to get through it, but also, you know, the people who are around you might not feel comfortable 
uh, you know, talking to you about every goddamn thing that's going on in their lives. And sometimes it's really, really big shit. So maybe cut everybody some slack, you know, like, I think that that's a really useful byproduct of this arc is like, we all love Rena. We all love, you know, the fact that she's, despite going through all of this bullshit, she's still trying. She's still giving it her all. And I think that that's, you know, you can map that easily onto other people in your life, in your lives and in your life. And it's, it's, it's this, this series is extremely powerful in that way. Anyway. Um, I do want to bring up what Tan Star said in chat too. Um, Keiichi is also pretty necessary to this narrative, and I am glad his role in this narrative is someone who, like at the beginning, does not understand what uh, Rena is going through, but by the end of it, is actively trying to help. Yeah, her. it's it's also interesting because Keiichi is a a dumb fucking idiot, so mm -hmm. it's it really helps dumb fucking idiots understand like how to <laughs> how to approach this i'm i'm being extreme but that's kind of the point keichi is extreme keichi doesn't do things half-assed keichi um when uh, keichi will <laughs> keichi w when told hey um you should tell you shouldn't keep secrets from your friends well then just fucking unload every single thing in his life onto his friends and his friends will be like what well, you don't need to tell us every single fucking thing, dude. And he'd be like, oh, wait, I just understood what nuance is. I just understood what what context is. I, like, the man is nothing if not um, just zero to 100 on all aspects of his life. And I love that about him. And I love that he eventually learns nuance. He eventually learns, like, the specifics of how friendship works or how it should work and <laughs> you know not exactly giving your friends carte blanche but also you know trusting them understanding that hey in situations like this it's better to you know trust them than not so anyway a thought i had uh regarding that that i always found interesting was that heichi has the opportunity to like see the consequences of his actions very literally in a way that most people can't. And I feel like there's something to be said for like Ryu Kishio 7 addressing the type of person who doesn't think through the consequences of their actions and is like, no, no, like here is, here's what ha happens. Here's how you can grow and mature as a person. If you literally consider what would happen if I did this and it's like, oh fuck, everything would go bad. <laughs> It's it's interesting. I I forget where I heard this, but I I heard it said that um, people who lack empathy are largely unimaginative. Um, they can't imagine. They can't think of what things would be like if they were different. If they had done something extremely fucked up, they can't imagine how that would mess with the people in their lives. And I think that yeah, KG is nothing if not imaginative. And I think it's it's yeah. It, I, He's he's just a lovable idiot, and I really wish that he would stop being so fucking horny all the goddamn time, and I really wish that that maid shit... I, I don't know. It's hard because the maid thing at the very end, I kind of cringed at it, but at the same time, it's like, I get it. Like, I get it. He's a kid, you know? And also, he's kind of... I don't think he has context for, like, love. I don't think he... And I think he kind of puts it in a horny box and he doesn't really understand that there's more that's going on here. Am I okay? Well, just, let's just jump to the very end real quick. I've got more things that I want to talk about, but specifically I have written here. Uh, Keiichi didn't realize Rena was basically confessing her love to him. Well, um, to me, and I don't know if this is just me, but Rena was saying very specific things to him. Uh, like the the thing about wanting to wake up and have him greet her in the morning and have her say good night at night combined with the the moment where she was saying hey um I, you know we'll do all of this uh, i want to do all of this over basically i want to you know um do all this over and one of the things that she said was i want to uh fall in love with you all over again something along those lines and Keiichi just blasts past it. <laughs> I was like, 
bro, <laughs> like, can you not see what's hap what, what she just said? I don't know. Is it just me? I no, I, yeah, I thought it was more mutual on their part. They're both saying very similar things. Yeah, at the rooftop. Okay, maybe it's just me. I, I, I think it has to do with the fact that she was swinging a hatchet at his head at the time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's part of it. Yes. But yeah, like um, Keiichi and Rena and even Mion and Keiichi, they both have like a very kind of like early teen pseudo romantic, but like at the very least super super deep friendship and relationship with each other. Mm. So it's like it's that thing where it's like. Am I in love with my friend or do I just care about them? I'm not sure, kind mm. of thing. I mean, yeah, I think uh, I kind of feel like <clears throat> that uh, Keiichi has kind of promoted into actual uh, romantic feelings for Rena for all 10 to 15 minutes of however long it actually matters. But the, I, I do feel, I mean, maybe I'm just an optimist, but I do kind of feel there's something different on the rooftop as opposed to the first time way back at the water gun fight, I'd like you to see me in a more romantic mode. Well, Keiichi blasts past that, but he also kind of has an excuse because they're in club mode and Reyna could very well just be saying that to distract him. Right. We all know she's serious, but Keiichi doesn't quite have that context. Right. <clears throat> so uh, going back a little bit, I I'm going to do this as quickly as I can. Um, so big moments. Um, Rena is Dexter in this, um, <laughs> which is just incredible. I love that for her. Um, Rena crying at the dump was super, super powerful. Um, Rena, the voice actress yeah. transitioning from laughing, which is the classic Rena laugh now, which is just Rena laugh dot MP3, <laughs> which is, it's like they're using, I don't know if, are they using the same laugh every time or is the voice actress giving a different laugh every time? I, there's some times where it's like, okay, that sounds exactly the same as the previous laugh, but. She does it every time uniquely. Like it, okay. a lot of times Jap Japanese voice actors train for a long time and sometimes destroy their voices. Oh, well that fucking sucks. Um, but yeah, water, um, everyone. <laughs> it's a feel good story for the ages. Um, oh, she must have clawed out her th vocal cords for the, cause she got the, anyway, <laughs> is that a joke? Anyway? Uh, yeah. So her transitioning from laughing to just sobbing is very powerful. And then the, all of the art there is just super, super good. Um, the, the conversation is, is, you know, you can watch it and it's definitely, Keiichi trying to, you know, help, and I think it's it's all so short-sighted and kind of ominous to me. Um, it's it's really kind of like, oh, this is the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of things getting really awkward. But it, it you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So in this case, it's very apt. Um, but at the same time, you know, just the just the raw emotion raw raw fucking emotion and she does it again on the rooftop um she doesn't transition into uh, from laughing into crying but you know, her crying in in Keiji's arms was super super powerful like major fucking props to the voice actors and actresses on this like holy shit like so fucking good um so yeah uh can, to continue uh uh, this one's going to be pretty hard. We didn't do the, uh, we didn't do, um, we didn't, we didn't talk about trigger warnings, um, at the oh. beginning of this, oh, yeah. but I do, oh, yeah. I do want to mm. stress, um, the, the thing, the thing that I want to talk about right now is, um, about self-harm and, uh, suicide attempts. So if that's not your thing, then fuck, you know, get out of here. Uh, you know, much love to you. Um, do not, you know keep going if if you if you're just not in it if you're not in it's it's the holidays you know let's talk about this shit um but yeah i think it's extremely important to talk about so uh let's dive right in so in this uh, there is a scene where rena vividly describes uh slitting her wrists and or wrist and watching maggots like pulling out i think that i think that that is ex it is such a powerful scene very very impactful um and i think it's done 
pretty goddamn well. I I don't think that it's done like with the idea that you would gawk at it because it's largely Rena saying what happened and kind of blasting past almost to the point where you 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 could kind of you, you have to double take because like wait you just said because she goes right into talking about the maggots like crawling out and focuses entirely on the maggots and it's just like no you're you're cutting your wrist open like you're you're actively like you know there that whole scene about her meeting oyashiro sama um and how she can't think about that stuff or else she gets really upset it's super fucking yeah it's just, it's fuck it's fucking sad and yeah i fucking some black fan take notes martha's dead. <laughs> martha martha's dad needs way more notes than that but yes 1000 percent. also take notes of the the company that decided to sign off on that scene and then say no it's okay we can have the scene where she slits her wrist but as long as you put um a message at the end that says hey don't kill yourself <laughs> that fuck uh, what was the name of that anyone who knows the name of that company like post it because fuck them man fuck them anyway so fucking dead and there's also that's one of those things where it's really hard to do like i, I don't even think you can do that in a visual medium um it's 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 nigh impossible because of just the way that the visual depiction of that kind of thing is in it in it can inspire people to do that and it's really the whole I, I forget what it's called um there's a response that um uh that uh, it has been documented um in in people when they watch something like that actually uh, suicide like you know uh, attempts go up um just by simply watching you know, someone else do it it's like it's almost like a sympathetic response i forget what it's called sympathetic suicide i forget exactly what it is but it is that is one of the main reasons why martha is dead is just like fucking completely like terrible like one of the uh, there are many 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 other reasons nazi sympathy being one of them but um oh my i know a nazi he was a great guy yeah, fuck off <laughs> like, guess what all nazis are bad <laughs> anab anyway um but like oh, i'm rambling i don't i'm fucking does anyone want to talk <laughs> um i think uh murder bear brought it up in chat but um i uh, and you know they can probably talk about that more but i'm glad like there's not like a specific thing pointed to uh about rena that's like like the cause like she yeah. it's just her life <laughs> yeah i can talk about that if you want that like the thing i really like about rena is that there's no single thing wrong with her you can't just say oh it's you know PTSD or oh it's mental illness or oh it's you know the parents divorce it's all of it it's all of her experiences it's all of her life it's all the systematic issues she's trapped in and all the different things that have shaped her and it makes it so there there is no single solution or treatment to you know dealing with Brenna's life there's just every single like every single thing she does to cope with it and some things that will, like, there are aspects of Rena where she will never, like, never overcome, you know, elements of her trauma, never overcome elements of, you know, like, the things she's gone through, and she just has to adapt and live with it. And to a certain extent, I think Keiji's arc is realizing, like, that you can't just that's not something that you can just fix, but that you have to accept that this is a complicated person with a lot of complicated issues going on. And you are going to grind up against that and you are going to have issues with that. And you are going to have to learn to accept this person as who they are. And I love that, like so much of what makes the final battle work for me is how much it is Keiichi accepting Rena as who she is, as the 
flawed, nuanced, complicated person that she is, and that acceptance over the course of this fight, you know, that, uh, that acceptance and that internalization of her really helping to bring her back. And something about that just really struck me. I was just like, yes, you know, this is, this is what it is. It's just realizing that people are people and they're complicated and there's a lot of shit going on and yeah. how hyper specific as the Gail, how hyper specific she is as a character is beautiful to me beautiful is how i try to approach my own character writing and it's magnifique with this one yeah, yeah. if i may i believe gail also probably I, they've mentioned a lot of very good uh extra like real life context of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh mental health and pharmaceutical uh issues and treatment in japan gail do you want to uh discuss any of that um, I would, but I, I definitely want to wait until we sort of get to the group discussion. Be just because it's like, I, I want to make sure that... Are we, are we still in the... Um, Bob, where do you think we're at right now? Uh, the first, like, talking about um, uh, big moments uh, for the people who haven't gone through. And then yeah. getting so to theories. I, I'll, I'll, I'll wait until the end because... Okay, sorry. Um, I wasn't I wasn't oh, sure yeah. if we were still in the first part or the second part. Yeah. What, and so I'm totally good with waiting for that. I because it makes me really happy to hear y'all uh, who are new readers have this space to talk because it's actually really important to me. I love it. Yeah. And I should mention, I like while I finished Shigarashi, I finished it like last month. So a lot of these are still very fresh in my mind. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I'll try to keep this quick, but uh, a lot of the time I think about how a game like Silent Hill 2 has kind of influenced me as a human being. Um, it's something that I'm really kind of in the middle of figuring out um, as I write my video on the... Um, uh. <laughs> and um, uh, $5 denied. Um, God damn it. Sorry. Uh, it's like a whole pizza. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm I like, would where like. How are you getting a pizza for five dollars? I would like. Uh, Caesars. I would like. <laughs> they a, increase around prices here, around here to, for, uh, yeah. for seven dollars here. That's a pretty good deal. Here, 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 here I'll, I'll help wow. you out. I would like a medium pizza, please. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, Ursula Cat. Hey, hey, Bob is working on a video about fuck. Yes, yes, I am working on a video about fuck. Uh, Hi. Finally. <laughs> it is kind of a video about fuck. Anyway, um. A Before we move a on, uh, can I talk about my kind of relationship to the whole scene about her going to the mental hospital and shit? Uh, you Stop. can. I was uh, a little in the middle of... Um, uh, oh, sorry. No, uh, go ahead. No, it's my own damn fault. I made a stupid joke. Um, but yeah, real quick. I'll, I'll keep this real quick. I often think about like how Silent Hill 2 has influenced me. And one of the main things that I think about that really makes that experience powerful is what it said about Angela and how... Um, you know, someone who is going through shit isn't broken. That that it, you can't like fixing them isn't the point. It's it's accepting them and accepting what they went through and what they're going through and being honest and open about all of these things. And that's how you. That's how you, you know. It's 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 not about um, acclimating them to your space. It's about creating spaces for everybody so that you know we can just make it through this fucking life and in that like the way that i think about silent hill 2 and how it influenced me and how it influenced my how i interact with people um i i can't help but wonder if i would have been a better person if when i was a kid and growing up and learning more lessons than just that one if i had played higurashi when I was at a extremely impression, like a uh, 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 extremely um, sensitive age, where I could ingest a lot more of these messages and be be open to them, um, not that I, you know, I'm not now. It's just that, like, man, Ryukishi is like giving you the like, giving so many people just a, a straight up guidebook on how to be a fucking good, decent human being. And it really fucking kills me that like, you know, uh, I didn't play it sooner. So that's basically where I'm going with that. Um, anyway. 
uh, Polyester Pimp, the song is uh, prose from the Higurashi OST. Uh, Arp, did you want to mention your experiences? Right. So um, it was very weird reading through this when Rena started talking about her experiences when she went and was committed to the mental hospital and the suicide attempt and stuff like that because I went through that almost fucking beat for beat. Um, if I can get a bit personal, uh, for a while I wasn't allowed to have knives in my apartment, to put it gently. Mm -hmm. um, so I was committed for a few days and I had to be put on new medication. And the difference between her and me is that when she went into the hospital, she was given all these super heavy drugs that fucking obliter obliterated her emotions, like, made her non-functional for a while, uh, annihilated her memory. For me, that's what sent me to the hospital. I was heavily overprescribed, um, very strong uh, drugs, which was giving me serotonin syndrome. Um, I My memory is completely gone. I can't remember anything for shit. Uh, there's large parts of my 20s I can't remember at all. Um, and then in the hospital, the... The doctor was like, oh, you're not supposed to be on these. You just need to be put on a mood stabilizer. And that's a whole nother story. But it it was so weird to see something depicted so accurately and thoroughly and correctly. And that just really stuck with me. And it really, really cemented that uh, Ruby Kyo 7 really knows what the fuck he's talking about. Yeah, it's it's super, super powerful. Um yeah, well, thank you for sharing. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's very, yeah, that, that's powerful and helpful. And yeah. Um, uh, something I want to mention, and uh, I can share this with Indestructible Cat as well, because they brought up as well. But when the hostage situation was happening, if we're talking about like big things that impacted us, when the hostage situation was happening, it was one of the most genuinely scary things because of how much it resembled the actual real life Kyo Ani arson that happened in 2019, where a guy went to the Kyoto Animation um, uh, Studios, uh, dumped a shitload of gasoline at one of their entrances, lit on fire, and then just let the fire and the smoke force people upwards, where it killed something like. 30 people, 30 something people. It killed half of the entire mm -hmm. staff. Of yes, them. there was 60 people in the anime studio. It killed like 30 of them. And then most of the rest were hospitalized due to a combination of injuries, smoke inhalation, and trauma. Uh, many of them could return to work. Uh, and yeah, it was one of the, it was, I believe, the worst massacre in Japan since World War II. Uh, and like seeing how easy it was to pull off to the point where it almost could act as a guide really affected me. Anyways, I don't want to hog this one since I think Indestructible Cat also want to talk about it. Uh, well, I'll talk about it uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, uh, you you actually brought it up, Bob, and that uh, when Oishi said, like, how was uh, someone able to have access to something like this? Um, now, after the Kyoani attack, you, you can't get that much uh, gasoline anymore in mm. Japan. Which, you know, for good reason, but yeah, no, the, I, if, if that had happened, I don't think, I, even now I think, uh, with how empathetic Ryukishi is, I don't think he would have wrote Sumi Horoboshi this way mm -hmm. if he, if this had happened at the time. Which is interesting so, because, oh. um, uh, there were specific sorry. references to the sarin gas attack. Mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. I don't know anything about other than there was sarin gas involved. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about that specific stuff, but yes, uh, that's, yeah, yeah. yes, it's, no, uh, it's, you know, it's a big thing. Tell you more since it's uh, related I, to Amsha and Rikyo I, and the cults and just cults was, in Japan in general. So I'll I was basically too. just pointing I, a gale signal into the sky and turning it on uh, just now. So I did just want to say, uh, Kat, since you mentioned that, one other thing I want to mention specifically because of that was uh, there's actually a very similar thing to that happening. Uh, Stephen King wrote a, a novella called Rage, 
that was all written from the perspective of a school shooter and it got really into the head of the main character all that and it inspired copycat incidents because it was so realistically drawn and after a couple of those incidents uh stephen king insisted that it all copies be taken off the shelf and it never be reprinted because he did not want his work inspiring real life violence uh and i feel like definitely ryukishi if higurashi had happened shortly before the kiwani attack he would have done the same i mean he did um prevent me on from using her bb gun i believe because there were actual yes. bb gun incidents in real life and he did pull uh kikonia arc 2 because it ended up being too similar to the real life pandemic hmm you know, that's that's a thing that we should probably talk during the group discussion. I'm actually going to make a note about it, about um, how it is interesting how um, in this context, Ke uh, Keiichi is sort of forgiven, kind of, sort of, by um, his friends for what he did. But there was a moment where I believe it was Rika or maybe it was, no, I think it was Rika who, sp who said, um, yeah, we can't really give you, like, forgiveness if that's what you're looking for, because we're not the people who you hurt. You're going to have to mm -hmm. talk to the people you hurt in order to get forgiveness. And I think that that's incredibly, like, poignant. I think that's super fucking important for a lot of people who don't understand that, like, guys, you can have, like, it's like we were talking about before on previous um, chats. Like, there's a difference between, you know, having empathy for the person and then like uh, like uh, excusing their crimes you know there's a there's a difference um and th that difference is highlighted in that scene and mm -hmm. yeah so anyway oh um, i i will actually never mind. i'll say it for a group discussion all right since I, you're okay that yeah i only have one other thing to talk about which is um rena didn't block her face um oh god that hurt me that 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 cut deep that was raw. That was rough. Um, so Keiichi, as described earlier, wonderfully by Jan, um, Keiichi, uh, basically remembers the events of, um, Onikakshi and arc one. And, um, in remembering it, he remembers Rena, uh, basically like, oh, like running to him with open arms to basically be like, you know, I trust you. It's okay. It's, I guess in an effort to calm him down, um, and then he swings his baseball bat at her head and she doesn't move to, to block it. She just has her hands open. And that is such a fucking powerful symbolic moment. And yeah, I just feel like that is, uh, we're talking about big moments. That was a big one. Cause that was just like, oh fuck. I can't even describe it other than that. It's just like, God damn it. Like, that sucks so fucking much. Um, also, real quick, uh, now that we're we're past that, uh, just want to give myself a little pat on the back for calling this entire arc. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, just before we get into the proper group discussion, I do want to get Talzreel's like key moments, just because uh, I don't think we quite got it. Okay, so um, I'd certainly say that one of my um, key moments was the um, was the junkyard scene where um, Keiichi says you're crying, and like he 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 somehow has he's finally on the other side of reading people's true emotions. Everyone's been doing it to him for five arcs. He's finally doing it to Reina that he can see that she's crying on the inside. And that one was a big moment for me in the narrative there. Um, yep. Uh, and also, I mean, the final, the climax, the final scene, of course, with the, the sword versus a uh, bat fight and how it's just such a mirror to the water gun fight originally. And, how they synchronize and how they're, I mean, and how Reina's, and how the fight is waking Reina up out of her delusions. And she's realizing that she doesn't really want to be doing these things. 
and uh, just e even in my notes, I'm recording. Like I'm even marking. Wait, is it fine? Is it going to work? Is this actually going to lead to a good ending? Ha <laughs> ha! No, not ultimately, but it, it did well enough. Yeah, in the moment. Yeah. Well, a, a little note uh, here. Uh, if Keiichi did nothing else, he did save Rena because she was taken away to the police station, which is not located in Hinamizawa, and she thus escaped the gas. Rena survived if nobody else did. But mm, that seems like that seems like a bad thing. Um, to me. She's... Go ahead. I, I mean, yeah, it's complicated sense of, I mean, it certainly wouldn't sound like Keiichi survived unless he was, unless he would have been camped out, at, unless he would have been allowed to camp out at the, um, at the state, at the police station with her, which I very much oh, no. doubt Keiichi's the police would have let him do. So he oh, was probably in Hinamizawa uh, when it went down. No, no Keiichi's very dead. Keiichi's very dead. They all died except for Rena. Except for Rena. Beyond Bion also live? Well, well just, be, just because she's in, like, the... Um, Oishi uh, survives, too. She right? was in ok Okinomiya when this happened, I think. And Oishi survives, yeah. I thought they took yeah. her to the Erie Clinic, which is in Hinamizawa. Yeah. I, I, I don't actually know. Maybe, now that I say this, I'm not sure if I remember the Super Bowl. I just thought I remembered that Shion specifically was in Okinomiya so that she technically survived. Oh, Shion? Oh, she yeah, yeah. yeah Shion. Yeah, oh. Shion, yeah, survived, yeah. I would imagine. Oh, shit, you said Mion. I thought you were asking if I lived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're well, killing me off, Yon. Sorry, you had to learn it this way. Sad. Sad I had a genuine Rika me moment. <laughs> me Beep. Uh, one last thing I just I guess I'll highlight is I like that uh, uh, all the other chapters KHE is the one who's picking up Satoshi's bat mm -hmm. and, and this time around it was Satoko just handing it to him and I feel like that's such a great moment and the first time she ever sees that bat or at least the first time he ever knows that she runs away from it but yeah. for her to just hand it to him was an incredibly like powerful moment it's you know that gets at least of, a plus three bonus. I, I, I feel like it's such a moment of her trusting KG because, because there are every other moment like he is him taking the bat is him taking agency away from someone, and in this moment, it is her entrusting it to him, uh, and in the process trusting him with it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um... Yeah, it makes me think, like, how many more moments in arc one would be would be different if you uh, go back to it after, like, playing arc six? I, I can say this. Uh, there's a moment in arc one where uh, Keiji is just practicing his swing out in the field. Uh, and Mion just comes out and she's just like, hey, uh, stop you're scaring everybody and like at the moment and you think oh you know like she's you know like suspicious okay it's like no he's fucking freaking out and everybody's scared because he just suddenly starts swinging his bat around like bro they're scared of you yeah it's it's really kind of like a lot of this stuff it's kind of brutally obvious in in hindsight uh moving it's really it's really sad if you go back uh, to that chapter and just place in the scenes and just like, oh my god, this is terrible. Yeah, if you want to see my reaction to realizing that, uh, check the Arc 1 stream um, where mm -hmm. I say, oh god, a bunch of times. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's, it's fucking brutal. Um, also, uh, thank you very much for the really kind note, uh, Polyester Pimp, and also, hi, Dr. Waddle D. <laughs> hi. Um, we're having a little bit of conversations in the chat, but I just wanted to mention, hey, uh, so yeah, moving on to theory crafting, um, real quick. Um, I guess we found out where, th uh, th uh, Tepe's corpse in arc three went, um, with, uh, Me uh, Mion's propensity to move corpses, uh, when shit is going awry, um, which honestly very forward thinking of her, um, 
exactly what I would expect from someone who threw bricks at people when she was a child. Um, and spent, uh, spent so long in jail cells, it felt like a second home. I think that's, eh, might not be what she said, but anyway. Got the alibis too. Yeah, <laughs> fuck yeah. So yeah, I guess that's where the, the corpse went. Um, yeah, um, Mion and uh, Mion got her, her crew, the S group, to dig it up and move it somewhere else. Um, I like the I like the connection between part five and part six here, where Mion creates an alibi because Shion had previously yelled at her, "Why didn't you make a fucking alibi?" Yeah, yeah, it's really kind of opening up, like why all this shit this is like kind of weird and awkward. But it these are the kind of things where it's like, okay, I can see if you were like really focusing on this arc and like really making meticulous notes, you could probably figure that out. Um, you could probably get to that that solution if you really kind of you know dug into it um, before it's revealed. But yeah. Anyway, um, Oishi's definitely oh, the. We'll go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say it's a real um, Occam's Razor moment where you're like, because of everything else happening, you're like, oh, this has to be like a big conspiracy, and at the end of it all, it's just. Oh no, she just moved the body. To yeah, no, place. it's it's totally mm -hmm. Mion having Keiichi's back. Like, and if you if you, it's funny because if you extrapolate from that, like we all kind of uh, assumed when um, they were saying that Keiichi was at the at the event that they were kind of covering for him and he was just being kind of a big dumbass and being like, what? I'm not two people. What is happening? Reality is crumbling in front of my face. Which, that should be the American dub, KG, by the way. Whoa! <laughs> oh, sorry. Have you seen uh, Casey and Friends? Uh, no. Oh, I got, I'll, I'll have to link that. As, Keep uh, that saved for later, I think. But yes, Casey and uh, Friends is a certified fucking classic. What is it? Um, it's just like um, uh, it's like a four kids parody of Higurashi. Yeah, four kids. Right, hey, that yeah, four kids, it, like uh, the dub company. It. it oh, it, okay. All right. Yeah, it's a parody that essentially follows, like, what if the Higurashi anime was dubbed by four kids? Okay. And so it has, like, comedically bad censorship of gore and scary things and stuff. Cool. And um, it, it, the video is from, like, 2009 or something. It is ancient, but... So it's, classic shit. It's the, it's the um, Mr. Show skit of Pally's. I'll pretend I know what that means. Yep. Uh, oh. If you if you haven't I seen it, no, I don't remember that skit though. Go on YouTube, look up Pally's Mr. Show. It's it's I a four TV that. version of basically a mafia um, show where they oh, censor out um, um, people getting shot in the face by by doing jump cuts to uh, further <laughs> in. Like someone will get shot, they'll pull out a gun, and then it'll immediately cut to the other person laying on the floor. <laughs> and uh, at one point, uh, uh, David Cross gets really angry and starts screaming, but he's screaming curse words, and so he's overdubbed with mother, father, Chinese dentist, and then <laughs> everything explodes. Anyway. Sounds similar, yeah. Uh, uh, oh. remind, uh, they actually did a four TV cut of Showgirls. And it is hilarious. That sounds fun. Anyway, uh, okay, cool. I will definitely check that out later. Um, someone, I need to remind myself to do that. Anyway, uh, back to... What's that? Who else has got theories? Let's hear about them. I, I do actually have a further thought or more of a question since we're on the subject of Tepe's corpse. Um, so, the... So as far as Tepe's corpse being uh, dealt with by Mion, that all checks out. But uh, the issue I have from that is what happened to Satoko after that? Because Satoko, I mean, Keiichi goes to Satoko's house afterwards, having heard some rumors about Tepe still being around. And he finds uh, Satoko boiling herself in the bathtub and he rescues her from that. So I think kind of the key question is, why was she doing that if we have good reason to believe that Tepe was disposed of? I think that, um, for me, 
it's tough to talk about because in that specific instance, it's it's one of those things where, and you get a lot of this throughout this entire arc, and I'm actually really glad you brought this up because it is kind of an underlying element of um, wanting uh, victims wanting to be punished, basically, like basically like manipulating situation. Like this is you see this happen a lot with Rena, where Rena is basically like looking to be punished for the sins that she feels she has committed even if they're not sins like in a lot of these instances like rena you, you did nothing wrong like you're in a stressful situation and you reacted in you know extremely and that's you know that's totally understandable like you know and she's just beating herself up you see this a lot with her reaction to her parents getting divorced where she blames herself and it's just like rena god damn it <laughs> You didn't, you didn't, that's not on you. And, you know, I think that the same thing happens with Sotoko. Um, I think that she's turning the, the situation against herself and make, and basically want, uh, you know, she'll, she'll hear, you know, uh, Tepe say like, oh, you're, you know, you're dirty or, you know, take a bath or something. And because she specific, and this is a larger conversation that we got to have at a certain point. I really fucking hope that Ryukishi calls this out specifically, but I am not here for the Satoko fucking blame game shit. I am not here for um, Satoko uh, punishing herself for being a child who wanted to be saved from a stressful, stressful situation. I am not here for like the way that it's framed Satoko wanting um, her brother to help her in stressful situations when it came to her aunt, that's framed as a problem that Satoko is immature or Satoko is the, the instigator and should be punished for that. And I think that she definitely feels that way about herself. But I think that a lot of the characters also feed into that, especially w during the... the um, the dump scene and that's one of the main reasons why i called that scene ominous because it's there's this moment where rika is like oh even satoko knows that she was she fucked up and that was a sin on her part and satoko's eyes just go just gloss over and she's like yeah yeah i really fucked up and i'm like god damn it what did what did you fuck up what did you do wrong i don't i don't get i'm i'm fucking mad <laughs> like she did nothing wrong she was a kid she was a child in a uh, anyway I, I am waiting for Ryukishi to talk about that. I am waiting for that to be a theme that we revisit. It has to be. I can't imagine, like every time it shows up, I get mad because it's like, anyway, I don't mean to belabor I, the point, but. I have a terrible premonition about that. Like, um, I, so we, we've seen a lot how Keiichi and Satoshi kind of rhyme, in a sense. Keiichi does a lot of things despite being Keiichi versus Satoshi. They're, they're notably different people. But then Keiichi does a lot of exactly the same things that Satoshi does. Making the phone call before uh, Watanagashi in Arc 3 in particular. I... My... I'm having the terrible sense. I mean, and th there was also a scene per in arc six in particular, Keiichi calls out, Keiichi's perspective calls out that Satoko says something about uh, Satoshi not coming back sometime during this arc. I forget exactly when, but she observes that, that, the, that he's not coming junkyard. back. Oh. Sorry, it was, it was in the junkyard scene, I believe. Junkyard scene, okay. So yes, Keiichi, Keiichi our, our, our dense boy, notices that that's not something she normally says. She's normally insisted that he will return someday. She's waiting for his return. My, the fear I have is that, so remembering the end of arc three, uh, Keiichi follows... Uh, Satoko to the bridge. Satoko thinks he's killed uh, Rika. She's understandably uh, panicking about it. 
and she eventually she throws Keiichi off the cliff. And I have the the horrible suspicion I have is did she do that? I mean, and she throws Keiichi off the cliff, and as she's doing that, she's saying, "Stop saying things in Keiichi's voice." She's actively denying that the Keiichi in front of her is the real Keiichi because he he did he did killer things, and she she can't believe that he's uh, her beloved dollar store Satoshi. And that leaves me with the horrible feeling that she may have done something like that to real Satoshi, or or to 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 the real Satoshi because Satoshi did something that made her think he wasn't himself anymore. Um, I can speak a little um, on like the the sin thing uh, because. That was a line that was also bothering me a lot, like the specifically the kind of like blaming on Sa uh, Satoko. Um, granted, I'm getting this from Wikipedia, which does source some like real places and a place called like Spiritual Life. So take this with some salt. But um, basically, the idea is that Shinto uh, considers sin like something different. Uh, sin isn't just like a. What is it? It's not just like a um, a breaking of a taboo or like a um, a wrongdoing of someone. It's also like a, depending on the word used, it's also just a word for like um, both like breaking taboos, so like evil deeds, uh, assorted like defilement, and also like just any disasters or like um, what's the word like negative things happening to you. So like a lot of uh, Shinto will cover um, or. There's a lot of like purification rituals and stuff to like get rid of this sin, which um, in the more broad sense is like sumi. And it basically just means like um, if you have sin, um, then it can negatively affect you. It's basically like something bad happened to you. You now have this, um, this pollutant on you and... Um, it can do things like cause further disasters, spread disease, something like bad things will keep happening. But if you purify yourself, uh, not only will this pollutant be gone, but also like good things can start happening to you kind of thing. So it's like, um, it's not wholly blaming, um, it's not wholly blaming Satoko, like saying like, oh, you should have um, reached out for help or you should have not, not been a child who was uh, in, in fear. Though I do think part of that is also the self-blame that she's feeling. But it's also just a, like, this is something bad that has happened to you and is keeping and keeps happening to you. And we need to be rid of it somehow. Like, kind of acknowledging, like, a stain on her soul at the moment? Yes. Mm. I have thoughts on this, but I can't fully go into them without some context from later parts mm -hmm. but basically like and i know gail also has some thoughts on it so they can jump in it and with them but basically that i don't think i think that a lot of this needs to be understood in the lens of this is how children view responsibility this is how children view guilt and responsibility and that they can't really process the complicated nuance of like living in an abusive household and the things have been going on so they associate the fact that satoshi had to take like the brunt of this abuse for satoko as being satoko's fault um but again this is a child's perspective this is literally somebody who can't understand like complicated family dynamics right viewing this kind of stuff um I think this is addressed, but I think a lot of it is just like the idea that children internalize guilt and responsibility in a way that, you know, like you can't really understand from adult perspective. But there's right. mo there's more to it, but I can't really go in fully now. Well, I hope there. Go ahead. 
I'm sorry. I also wanted to add um, some information about a more recent case in Japan. Um, God, when did this happen? Uh, I think this happened in 2019. Um, a young girl who was... Sorry, a five-year-old girl was, she, she died due to incredibly severe abuse from her family. Um, she weighed like 26 pounds when she died. And she, she died basically due to starvation. Um, and her family kept her in essentially a side room. And they found a journal that she had been writing in where she wrote... Okay, sorry. Uh, where she was writing things like, Mama, I will make myself do much, much better tomorrow than I did today without being told by Papa and Mama, so please forgive me. Please, I beg you, forgive me. She pleaded in a notebook, used her writing drills forced on her by her stepfather, who also kicked and beat her. And there is a very unhealthy logic that a lot of children in incredibly situations can internalize, and that's especially the case for Satoko, whose aunt essentially spent all of her time picking and needling at every single thing that she did. The fact that they didn't fold clothes right, the fact that they didn't clean correctly, she would always find something to tell them that they were disgusting and dirty for and essentially failures. So when we're looking at her blaming herself or saying that she's committed some great sin because her brother was so good and she is so filthy inside in her mind it it really makes it clear to me um this kind of stuff that incident with this five-year-old girl who died led to um an attempt of reform to actually hire and fund uh, a very large increase in welfare workers and officers and um Ryukishi himself knows how many people how few people were welfare officers at this time. The fact that they were completely unable to get warrants by themselves and other similar issues like that. Um, God, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, and Ryukishi does touch on this more over time. There is a huge issue that they're in of he only has so much space and he's trying to make us compassionate about Satoko because uh, there was a huge fan response of considering her to be a, a very annoying child. Like, Shion's actions towards her are very, very reflective of a readership that also felt that way about Satoka, who also blamed her for her situation. It's interesting. I, I, I'd like to know the fan response to Shion basically beating the shit out of her. If the, oh, if catharsis. That, catharsis? <laughs> a, a lot well, of people thought she was justified at the time. A lot of people did not read into her actions as something bad, which is something that Ryukishi continues to struggle with in all of his work. But from a narrative perspective, he spends so much of his time trying to make people compassionate for Satoko that sometimes it ends up coming across the wrong way, even though what Satoko is experiencing is re-victimization. Um, but this is something that I think he approaches much more intensely in Umineko and other works that he comes to. Sorry for going on about this so much, no, but there's no, a ton. A no, ton interesting, uh, interesting in how that flipped onto, uh, like, the blame for Satoko, like, in that scene also playing on the tree on an interesting way that also misses the point. So, one thing I want to mention that also struck me is how there's something of a patriarchal element of satoshi is considered a you know like good he's considered a good person by everybody he's considered like oh you're a good big brother protecting your sister if only your sister was more kind responsible and like you look at it as like he's not protecting her because he's a good big brother he's protecting her because he's a good person and like he doesn't want her to face abuse but there's also a measure of resentment there of the older brother is expected to just take the abuse and never like fight back or have like have long lasting problems. And it's just like, oh, if only your sister was like you. Like people are internalizing Satoko as 
the cause of Satoshi's problems because they expect that Satoshi just naturally should do that. And thus, if Satoko was more responsible, it wouldn't be a problem. But like, Satoshi is the nice kid and he's still getting abuse. Like, abuse affects everybody. And again, from a child's perspective, they can't understand that no single person lies like the blame doesn't lie with any single person's actions it just lies in the fact that children are being abused and this situation should not be happening full stop but again rena can't really like ren is a child she can't really process the nuance of that she owns a child she can't process the nuance of that and keech is kind of exceptional in that like he looks at it and he's like what the fuck what the absolute fuck guys no she shouldn't be dealing with this yeah, it's there's a lot to be said about the mind of a child and how a child processes trauma. The the book that I'm reading, um, the body keeps the score, is a lot about that. Um, has specific sections about how children process trauma and especially from caregivers, um, the way that children sort of turn that that sort of abuse onto themselves because they view themselves as the problem because the caregiver is the person who's supposed to be, you know, giving care. And if they're not, then it's like, well, that must be something on me. That me it must be something I'm doing because it's a very childlike thing to think that the adults know what they're doing. They're the ones mm -hmm. who, you know, I'm putting my trust in them because they are the ones who are in charge of me without them. I like, they literally cannot think of a world beyond um, their caregivers. And so it's very, you know, you know, it's very, it's a very childish thing. Um, and I don't mean that in like a negative way, but it's a very childish thing to think I am the reason why, and to see that. And I, th I know that there's a conversation to be had and I don't, you know, I'm, I don't believe that just because you include a topic in your material means that you're an advocate for it. You know, I, I, I think that there's a lot of stuff in here that's just it requires a more nuanced conversation. And to be honest, remembering when Ryukishi said, Hey, um, oh, what did he say? It was something along the lines of like, um, nothing good happens when a child is forced to become an adult. And mm -hmm. it's like that right there should be enough, but it keeps happening where, uh, like I, I, you know, Gail saying that thing about the fandom makes me think that like, is this just Ryukishi's way of like trying to get people to empathize with Satoko because they all think that she's just an annoying brat? Like, I personally, don't. Personally, uh, just real quick, like I personally think that uh, Ryukishi does in fact write like really good, really well thought out and like thoughtful works. But uh, a problem with both being in the like. And this is me generalizing a little bit, but a problem with being in the doujin space is while there's that freedom of like, you know, self-publishing, you also have the problem of like, you're going to get a lot of otaku and otaku aren't super known for like being very thoughtful. So it's like, oh man. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very valid point. <laughs> so yeah. uh, something I want to follow up on uh, that you mentioned, Bob, was the thing about like caregiver trauma, things like that. I was mentioning earlier today in the chat um, the works of Nagata Kabi, specifically uh, her book My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness. And there's one line in there that always strikes me where she talks about how like she's constantly beating herself up and like denying herself from ever having good things. And I should mention this is a person who by this point was like 28 years old. She's living with her parents, they're like talking about like denying herself ever having good things, denying herself any joy and pleasure. And she realized she wasn't trying to please her parents. She was trying to please the person who was trying to please her parents. And since she thought that person was denying her from having any good things, she shouldn't have any good things. And then was shocked when that did not result in parental approval, because from their perspective, their daughter was just never having any fun or joy in life was never doing anything good and she was like i have so internalized a system of denying myself joy that i've forgotten what it feels like to actually let myself be happy because 
I can't see myself as anything other than the like I can't see myself as anything other than deserving this you know denial of joy this denial of closure and there's something to that with Sadako of she cannot allow herself to she she cannot allow herself to ask for help she cannot allow herself to be weak because then you know like she thinks oh that's what made Satoshi go away um and she just cannot see a world beyond that. Right. I wanted to also add on a more recent criticism that Ryukishi has drawn of his work is literally like he feels like he failed Sotoko in some ways, that he inadvertently gave her more of a role of a damsel in distress than he did as a person in attempting to get people to be compassionate about girls in her situation and uh, Ryukishi is like constantly criticizing his own work and trying to build on where he feels he failed but I think there's a very strong narrative issue in the fact that Sotoko's situation doesn't get to be as personal because it is essentially the core of all of arc three and we'll continue to see more of that. Whereas something like with Shion or Reina, their problems as they're explored are not the point of their individual arcs, if that makes sense. Satoko's interiority ends up not being as prioritized because all they can really, their entire goal is to try to change her situation so she there's not enough space at a narrative level sometimes to really engage with that aspect and it, it and i think it's interesting that ryukishi himself criticized himself for that and always is trying to improve how he considers how he writes victims because it's very very hard to write abuse situations <laughs> I would actually be really interested in seeing, like, knowing Ryukishi as writer now, how he would rewrite, like, especially some of the upcoming parts involving Sadako, like, knowing how he approaches those topics now. Because I would really be interested in seeing more of that interiority. That's Go Sotsu, the sequel anime, the whole thing. Mm. That that is, it is basically that. It's flawed because it's just an adaptation. We don't get to read his original work, which he actually did write a mm. script for Go Sotsu back in 2017, um, 2016, 2017. But yeah, like th that whole thing is actually him trying to reapproach the ideas of his own flaws. And Umineko mm. as well. <laughs> Umineko mm. is all about that. Umineko, I'm only two chapters in, but I there were definitely parts where i was just like jesus fucking christ <laughs> it is an excellent work tell. it is i think one of the greatest literary approaches of all time that's what i hear and i can't tell if that jesus fucking christ was a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> uh um, yes yes is my answer <laughs> <laughs> there you go i think it's also important to note how um rena at a certain point is uh i believe it was uh keichi and rena having a conversation and at a certain point i think keichi was basically like it look it doesn't matter uh if i you know think you know i can i, I helped you or i can help you or anything really it, it matters how you feel it matters how you know no progress is made um unless you know you come to these decisions for yourself and that uh, oh yeah it was i think it was the doctor actually there was there was the, there were the tips with the doctor which w it, it was, was funny because it, it was called, called the lunch takeout menu or yeah something. because the takeout it was, yeah, because it was like it had a lunch takeout menu on like the back or it was written on a takeout menu or something um, so what it was is um the notes that were supposed to go into rena's uh chart uh someone mistook for memos and so they wrote down the lunch order and then they threw all of those away which is why she and her dad didn't know what was going on with her incredible wonderful yeah. which, she was uh as someone who's worked in office settings a bunch that happens far more often than you would want to believe with super important documents i have had to fish many many vital documents out of my boss's trash 
Uh, speaking as bring my own personal experience and speaking as somebody who used to do surplus stuff that serviced a hospital, uh, whenever we would deal with furniture, we had to like take out all the drawers and like reach way into the back to find stuff because medical documents would just slip back there and then they would just be left there. And it's like, we we have to make sure that these get out because we can't sell these on surplus with people's private medical info in them because that had happened before and it was a really bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, HIPAA is a huge deal, but um, can I add like two things on this if, with regards to why that might have fallen through the cracks and also her misdiagnosis. Is that okay if I mention that real quick? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, okay, so she is diagnosed um, on paper with dysautomnia, which is not a mental disorder. It is a physical disorder. Um, of course, on the memos, like, they diagnose her with, um, they're diagnosing her based on DSMV4, which is flawed, and Japan still uses it today. So, you yep. know, don't don't take it necessarily with a grain of salt. But they, they're just like, diagnosing her, of course, with schizophrenic uh, tendencies as well as PTSD. However, because those are thrown away, she just ends up with that, like, diagnosis of dysautomnia, so she's probably given medication that don't actually, does not actually relate back to that. It's because that's, like, a physical uh, and a, like, a nervous system disorder more so. Mm. I'll... Um, I'll... Oh, yes? No, 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 sorry. I, I, I don't want to interrupt you to talk about this part. Oh, okay. And I was just going to mention otherwise... The reason that that could so easily fall through the cracks is because uh, inpatient mental hospitals in Japan are hyper understaffed. Like, as in, a nurse has to deal with 30 beds worth of people. There are a single psychiatrist has to deal with like 60 people. It is, they are incredibly understaffed. And it is like literally in 1984, there was a case of like, a mental hospital where they found out that like um nurses were literally uh beating patients to death with iron pipes so uh one thing i want to mention is something you mentioned in the discord chat earlier but another thing on sadako uh to remember with the scene with rena is that rena is heavily projecting at that point because if she like if she admits oh you know like sadako was correct to seek out help from her brother that would also point to the fact that rena never sought out help with her own personal issues with rena and stuff like that and so she can't say oh sadako was you know correct to do that without admitting that she should have also sought out help from friends yeah that tracks I think it's also partially reinforced by the fact that she feels like her own problems aren't as important as everyone else's. Mm -hmm. She's like, well, you guys, you guys have this situation and you couldn't even get help. So what was the point in me with this less important thing? I, I think if we want to do like character analysis stuff, I always found it super, super interesting that Rena, who is like outwardsly one of the most bubbly and cheery characters in the early parts is shown to have like one of the most cynical and distrustful outlooks on friendship because she has had her trust betrayed before you know like with her uh with her mother's affair with you know like uh her father slapping her with uh like all uh with the medical institution all that that she just does not feel that she can trust the people around her to have her back if she shows even a second of vulnerability everything must remain normal a st status quo must be maintained or so, everything so, will fall apart there's a quote i think that she says it's uh friends are just people you have fun with mm -hmm. you can't trust them yeah. yeah uh which goes kind of against what Mion said about you know like friends are a second family which it points to, like none of sadako's close family are around so all she has is her friends yeah mm. yeah. yeah just so much I, I this is what i love about higurashi because there's just so much going on you could have like 
these in-depth conversations about like single lines. No, care. Yeah, true. Like, um, yeah, uh, like the the line uh, from um, Irie uh, about wanting Sotoko in the maid outfit during the Angel Mort scene. Can we talk about the Angel Mort scene? Oh, no. Can we talk about the Angel Mort scene? What Angel Mort scene? Yeah, what are you talking about? There wasn't an Angel Mort scene. I'm going to uh, go ahead and interrupt since uh, everyone's been talking about their personal experiences. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about how important of a character Rena is to me in in particular. Go for it. Because like I I have uh, struggled with self harm. I'm like over eight or so years clean of 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 harming myself, and like when when I went through arc six, it just it the whole entire person Rena started to click for me. It was insane how much I could relate to her every move, her every thought, her like distrust of people. Like even if they're nice to you on the surface, you can never fully trust them enough that they won't hurt you later. And just like never being able to believe that things will continue to be fine because even if you try to be happy you keep waiting for the other shoe to drop and i can really really relate to that because like that feeling of it's almost like paranoia but not really that because things are good you inevitably think that eventually it will end and like, that is such a real feeling that I don't think a lot of media has been able to effectively communicate. So when I came across Higurashi doing that so well and so vividly, I, I was just struck by a sensation like, holy shit, this game fucking gets it. Ryukishi fucking gets it. Because I have never seen anyone communicate how... Even, even, and you keep comparing your situation to other people because, like, you're always like, oh, but I, I have it so good because I, at least I have a dad or something like that, or at least I have a house I can come back to. And you keep saying, oh, so I, I should be happy, right? Because I don't have it as hard as so many other people do. And, like, it's, but, it's so hard to see that because Rena keeps thinking that way, even though it's fine. You're in your own situation and it's fine to feel like maybe everything's not all right. Maybe there are problems in your life, even if other people have it worse. It's not a blame game. It's not about comparing your situation to other people because then you keep it's a vicious cycle of you just it never gets solved because you keep thinking of others and you end up not thinking about yourself and sometimes you have to be selfish sometimes you have to prioritize yourself and your happiness and yeah yeah and and i like rena is so fucking good like i think all of the characters are just really well made but just rena just hits me on a personal deep level and i i just this arc is fucking incredible and yeah despite some shady things like the the maid stuff which uh not a huge fan of that but it's still like well <laughs> the most incredible thing ever really no i i totally get that i totally feel that um which made stuff are you talking about the the forbidden oh oh, oh sorry uh, sorry i confused it with something else entirely made stuff i uh nope D don't remember it doesn't exist okay uh, all right I, not, 
Was, there's there's just like a few was, hours of this uh, 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 sound novel that are just lost to time. I don't know, I don't know what happened during yep. during it. It was weird. Um, but Not I just want to be the. It's, uh, it's, hold on. It's all it's all bussing say for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lara, I, I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, thank you very much, very much for sharing, and uh, congrats on uh, uh, eight years. That's that's yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Um, Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Thank Woo. You. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's all awesome. cicada heads cicada Good heads. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great but yeah no you're, you're thank you very much for saying that because i totally forgot one of the most powerful um lines in this which was yeah it was what you just said it was rena thinking to herself when i'm with Ke uh, keichi i'm not depressed wait what did i just say i'm not depressed yeah. and then just kind of you know w walking herself through that when she had realized she had uncovered something that she was sad and she, she was not feeling good and yeah and then covering it up and then yeah there's a moment at the very beginning even in the anime where she's go she's basically like i need to be happy that's who i am uh I, everything else must be erased i must only think about happy things say the magic word how Mm -hmm. and, and now know, we know the dark the truth that she, sorry part of the reason that she goes to the junkyard is because she feels guilty for not liking rena i believe it's like she feels like her dad is entitled to a happy life with somebody he loves and she doesn't want to be in that household because she knows she'll be miserable there and she doesn't want to make him miserable so she wants to give him space to be happy and she's like well my happiness comes second to his so yeah. are we going to talk about the hideout because i have lots of thoughts on Renda's hideout uh, uh okay my my main note with that is that it's fucking killer it fucking kicks ass yes. um also a uh, real quick just want to point out that in the anime uh one of the thi one of the things that's thrown away um by her father is the 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 colonel sanders statue from <laughs> arc one it's straight up Abs like there <laughs> Absolutely hooking up. Uh, but one of the things I, I wanted to mention this because and I think a lot of people will have the same experience. I've dealt with a lot of social anxiety issues for lo a lot longer than I would like to like acknowledge. Uh, and I have definitely had a lot of times where I I have to craft a space where I can just be alone like by myself and be with items of comfort and like to the point where if I'm not able to like craft that space for myself if I'm in like too public of a space like I can you know personal personal experiences here I just like start to break down uh and so when Rena started describing the little hideout she made I loved it because a, it sounds incredibly cozy, but B, it's clear that it is very much the space she has carved out for herself where she can be alone and she can be herself and she can be separate from everything else around her. Uh, and it's both beautiful, but also tragic when you realize that this is also a girl who would rather surround herself in trash than and like sleep in the back of an abandoned van than be comfortable in her own home in her own room that literally the presence of rena there is forcing her out uh and, I think and that's oh i was just gonna say that's why it becomes so tr like for me it was an extra tragic moment when rena like she realizes that she actually led rena to her hideout because now rena has not only violated her home but also her sanctuary. And so like, she's literally up against the wall of there is nowhere else I can turn to. There is no safe space for me. Like, and that's why like she gets pushed into this murder, both that and the fact that Rena literally tries to kill her. Yeah. I would, I would focus on the fact that, uh, Rena yeah. like literally tried to murder her. Um, but, <laughs> well, I don't even know. Yeah. Cause like during that fight, it, it seemed like she was going to kind of let up at a certain point. I don't know if anyone else got that vibe 
it, it, oh, yeah, it no, felt more like the, she was trying to threaten Rena. Uh, um, well, no, I think she literally said, I think I'm pretty sure she was going to kill Rena. <laughs> No, it, yeah, it was pretty yeah, clear she it, was about to kill her. Yeah, like, Lorena mm -hmm. was, like, five... Lorena was five seconds from blacking out there. Because uh, it's hard... If she hadn't... Because she's super... She's, like, on the... She's getting paranoid, like, at this point. Like, that's kind of happening. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, it might have been happening based on, you know, um, her previous mm -hmm. history on in the other town. I forget the name of it. Uh, uh, Shishabone City. I knew it started with an S and an H. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. There is a conversation to be had about... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, there is a conversation to be had about has Rena been infected this whole time with whatever the fuck... It, also, is there an infection? Like, do... Is that a thing? Like, do we believe that that's a thing still? I do. Like, I, I seriously... like. What, what theory are you going with most? Uh, aliens. Mm -hmm. Um... Now I'm going with sense. Angel Mort theory. Um, everything <laughs> at Angel Mort is uh, canon, and nothing else. Some else. disease going on at that place. Yeah, exactly. It's in the it's in the cake. It's like it's a nightmare. nightmare. It was she on all along. She's been injecting the cake. Oh my god, that makes more sense <laughs> makes than you probably meant it to. <laughs> yeah, it's too. Look, yummy. you just you put your hands together. You go, you, and then everybody kills each other. That was funnier because your mic cut out. <laughs> you were like, <"Eep." laughs> you're like, Eep. I think it was too high for the mic to pick up. <laughs> um, uh, but, but yeah, yeah, just on, on the hide, but just going back to the hide for a second, just that like, I would have loved a space like that as a kid, like as a kid dealing with social anxiety and depression. And to a certain point, I'm like, I wish, I wish I'd had this junkyard and this abandoned van because, like, it was a lot better than locking myself in my room for years at a time. Yeah, and it really, it goes to, sh like, it really spends its time showing us Reyna feeling more and more like her home is being invaded, taken from mm -hmm. her, that her space of safety is being taken, that, like, that there's a redecoration. She's like, I gotta be happy about this because it's like, yay. It's he's moving on, but also I feel sad somehow. And also, Reyna's perfume is here in my safe place. And part of why she it says that she takes these items is because she feels like they don't have a home anymore, and she wants them to feel like they have a home because she doesn't want to feel like she doesn't. Have a home. But then she also says, you know, like uh, then I remember that I'm surrounded by trash and that I too am trash. And oh, baby, I just want to, I want to. Slide that hide out, you know, wrap her up in a big blanket, just tell her it's okay, your problems are not as insurmountable as they seem. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also interesting. Uh, yes, that I, that's the thing that I was going to say originally is that she, she specifically like thinks of herself as like trash. Um, uh, and, you know, fuck that. <laughs> Absolutely 1000% re reject that shit. Um, Rena, if only you knew how much people loved you. <laughs> <laughs> if only you could see beyond the veil of your anime. Um, but, <laughs> Here's uh, the anime veil. <laughs> the, the, can I, uh, what can I ask the, a theory crafting question? Sure. Sure. What are your guys' opinion on Takano and her notes? Dude, she's she already said that she was like a she was like coming up with shit to like like it, she had like some kind of a fucking master plan Takano's fucking she's a bad actor man like something's <laughs> happening I don't fucking know what but I would not spend time with Takano like she oof. anyway I, I do love how similar her role is to Oishi in that regard yeah mm -hmm. yeah like I don't know if I still believe Oishi's like behind stuff but at the same time like it's kind of hard not to imagine him like having something to do with this. Also, I think that a lot of what um, Rena was saying was like partially on the mark. Like the stuff about the infection, <clears throat> like uh, not UFO parasites, but like something is happening clearly. Like people are getting infected with something. I think that the government testing um, people for infections 
uh, when they were working and then uh, at Hinamizawa and then having to get, you know, taken away and the cementing of Onigafuchi Swamp is is pretty much prime evidence for something, some kind of contaminant happening. Something is going on there. But anyway, and with Takano in particular, I think um, she's a lizard. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. She's actually uh, a, 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 a maid. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. She actually works at. Ooh, that's a, Angel that's a bold theory. Mm-hmm. She works at Angel Mart, and uh, <clears throat> her, her goal is to make every every human on Earth a maid for her. And that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think she's I like right. That's one of the arcs that I didn't read. <laughs> uh, maid arc. I guess um, this is not a theory crafting question anymore. Just I uh, want to get your general thoughts. Uh, I, I, this arc in particular, I think, is the most we see Rika dr- drop her mask, basically. Yeah. This is the most thus far and i'm wondering Definitely. what you think uh, does anyone else want to take this one i mean i've more or less already made given my thoughts in the in my previous commentary on establishing rika and B- burn castle together um yeah i mean we we definitely see a lot that um She's Jade. I mean, and we, we've also been getting some more of her thoughts from the poems that we can now correlate to Rika that uh, she's she's jaded from having to live through all these terrible timelines over and over again and die terribly at the end of each of them. She she's in despair because she's tried so many things and it hasn't worked. And and, and this. Uh, Sumi Horaboshi in particular was important to her because Keiichi uh, awakened to that awareness of a different timeline and he and he inspires her to to reinvigorate her I mean she she keeps referring to a labyrinth she's trapped in a labyrinth of misfortune and Keiichi inspires her to keep fighting when she was uh, she admits that she's a lot e- had been giving up more readily when on when thing when the timeline starts going off when it starts heading towards disaster she just kind of gives up because she she screwed up she she can't save it anymore but Keiichi's showing her that despite um, despite not being able to uh, cure Rena of whatever she's going through or whatever that syringe does I she she's in, she's inspired to make a better timeline even if it's not the true ending that gets her out of that maze um real quick uh i do i do have thoughts on rika and i want to i want to talk about those but uh, also, I, I've totally forgot to uh, write this down in my notes because I was writing my notes kind of sort of in the Discord. Um, and one of them was realizing that I think I know what's in the in the in the um, the file, the what file in the um, syringe. I think it's a vaccine. I think it's a vaccine to the to whatever is whatever um, Rena is sick with. And I think that that's why uh, because uh, Keiichi, uh, Sorry, I keep slipping. Um, Keiichi uh, mentioned uh, vaccines uh, er- uh, early on when he was talking with Rena about why the people of Hinamizawa would eat the guts of uh, the infected. And Keiichi was like, oh, it's a vaccine, right? Because, you know, you have a little bit of it, then your body knows how to react to it. And then, you know, and so, you know, Rena was like, that's very smart. What, when did you get smart? And um, Keiichi's like, I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so I think it's a, I think that's why um, uh, Rika died when uh, Shion injected her with the syringe. I think she died because the vaccine is, leg- is the, the infection. I think that it causes the infection, but it's also helpful for people who are infected 
Um, or at least that's kind of my initial thought thinking about it now. I don't know if that totally makes sense. But um, I don't know. I'm putting it out there. Fuck it. I guess Wasn't it's there a description in the scrapbook of a vaccine as like a form of the, uh, the Watanagashi? I, th I think so. If only to lend my theory more credence. Um, sure. I guess in kind of support of Bob's theory uh, or kind of a similar angle, if not necessarily the same one, um, coming at it from the parasite angle, I mean, simple parasites, not assuming full control parasites, but uh, simple parasites that could have that kind of influence injecting something that would kill them it would also make sense that it might cause a flare-up if if the parasites are introduced to something that is hazardous to them it could also excite them into an adrenaline state for um and which could then theoretically lead to um uh lead to that and we do have a, a site in the chat that she had knifed herself, so um, the, the syringe might be a complete red herring. Uh, but um, at the same time, if we if we want to assume that the that the the contents of the syringe could be both lethal and curing, uh, introducing something that's toxic to the parasite could cause them to flare up in a way that someone who is not currently suffering from acute uh, symptoms might suffer from them because they are exposed to that toxin or the cure mm. which is toxic to the parasites yeah i don't know if it's um parasites though i think that that's one of the extremes that rena went on but um but yeah uh that's that's me but um yeah rika rika rika's interesting um she wasn't that interesting before but she's starting to become more interesting i was kind of worried that it was going to be uh, turned into one of those oh she's not you know she's just a billion year old person trapped in the body of a 10 year old and mm, anyway um <laughs> seems to be a thing in anime um don't know why uh but anyway um i will say it's very fascinating um because she's constantly uh, not constantly but she's complaining about her body a lot she's complaining like god this stupid kid body damn it uh like the stupid kid body won't uh isn't good at fighting rena uh the stupid kid body can't process um wine um uh, but it's also kind of a good thing because she doesn't have to drink nearly as much of it to get crunk so that's good cool um but anyway it's 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 very interesting Hanyu is the real fucking mystery. Like, I, what the fuck is going on there? And why does she have horns? What the hell? Anyway, um, man, I, I don't even know. But yeah, Rika Rika's definitely interesting. I really liked her. Like, I, I love the idea of um, Ke uh, Keiichi remembering the events of arc one like i don't think i stress that enough him breaking the the veil i guess or seeing through it and see, and realizing what he had done in another arc is pretty fucking cool and i think that you know uh, you know rika being there to be like no this is fucking cool <laughs> it, it was it was it was it was helpful in noticing that it was really fucking cool um i just want to say i love to imagine that scene from Mion and sodica's perspective because they're just having a normal chat with keichi be like you do you don't need to share all your deepest darkest secrets and then all of a sudden he just starts bawling and going on about how he's you know killed Mion and rena and all that and Mion's just like keichi i'm not dead and then Chia comes in and it's like i don't know what happened he just started crying. No, I wasn't bullying him or anything. I don't know. He just started crying. <laughs> I love... I didn't bully him this time. This is the one time you this come in and I'm not bullying time. him. I no, promise. It, it wasn't this time. I just... I, I was being supportive. I was being good. Honest. Trust me. I love in the anime, 
because they go outside the the school for that scene or uh, the sound novel does such a fucking good job with having him break down in front of like everybody and just yeah. every like getting everybody's reactions to that is so fucking crucial and especially I, Chie's reaction which is just like uh are you okay <laughs> Well, she wasn't like that at first. Remember, uh, she was. Yeah. She was like. She, th she thought about intervening, but then thought against it because he was clearly going through something, and he didn't. Uh, she didn't want to exacerbate it. Uh, she mm -hmm. is a fucking real one in this in this arc. I don't yeah. know if you all noticed, but um, uh, she always is like one of the things uh, I love about she. I think I mentioned this to Art before. All the adults in the village, uh, in, up to including uh, Rena's dad, call her Reina. They don't respect the fact that she's calling herself Rena, except Chie. Chie always calls her Rena, and I love that little detail. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Again, it's just such Ryukishi did such a fucking good job. Like it's so I, holistic. It's so the writing is so fucking good I, I the character writing is the the consideration the the mr x the the fucking like the actual honest to god research that it took to make this fuck all of these arcs and the the data you get like you you can legitimately learn shit from this fucking sound novel it's it's truly impressive but anyway um yeah. Um, like you can learn about how much gasoline it takes to blow up a school. Yeah. Turns out, what was it? Four liters? Five, like five, four or five liters. Yeah. Yeah. Don't actually need that much. Just need to enclose it in a space and turns into a bomb. Yep. One of the things that really surprised me about this arc in particular was, um, I did not like KG before this, uh, arc. I, I had the same problems, you know, uh, it, it very obvious problems with KG. But I, this arc really rehabilitated him for me because, well, first off, you know, he find, his arc finally gets, like, slowly starting to come to a head. But um, another thing was just seeing how how Rena, like, views him. How, like, even at his, like, <laughs> worst, it, it, he still makes her laugh. Which, Yo. you know... <laughs> the only way that you can understand and and, and uh, enjoy Keiichi is if Rena gives approval. <laughs> so I had a, I think I mentioned before. I had a theory as to why Mion likes Rena, or why me. Well, maybe, but why Mion uh, likes Keiichi is like Mion is so used to everybody approaching her as, and this is kind of another thing in this arc and like Higurashi as a whole. Everybody approaches Mion with an idea in their head of who she is. You know, they're like, oh, she is a Yakuza boss. She's a tomboy. She's this. She's that. She's behind everything. She's part of this whole conspiracy. And, like, nobody just sees Mion. Like, nobody approaches Mion just as a person, just as who she is, which is this girl who likes games, but also likes dolls and, you know, like, is super active. Yeah, she's born to yakuza family but she doesn't really want and maybe, to be maybe, like maybe yeah. she likes a boy and, yeah but like then she meets keiichi and keiichi does not have a dishonest bone in his body he is physically incapable of lying to the point that where when he does everybody's like yeah you're fucking lying bro i can tell uh and so she, I, I like the idea that she likes him because she can just always tell what he's thinking he's never duplicitous he's never you know uh keiji is just i think you said it he's like a golden retriever and mion really likes that she can just deal with that <laughs> yeah and we also get, get to see more of, um sorry to interrupt but uh we also get to see more of keiji's just general backstory and how he's just like a person who was, you know, considered gifted and just the mm -hmm. stress of constantly, you know, yeah. punching for exams and going back and forth from cram school and just that coming to a head by trying to inflict um, violence via a BB gun. That's, that's, that is a lot. Um, and I, I, I did want to say, like, if, if we're out of theory crafting, I, 
like I said, like we we wanted to try to have like a theory crafting and impressions from the people who are new readers. But if like all of the new readers are like good on theory stuff, like we should probably move to individual impressions because a lot of people who have already read it have been contributing. But there's people here who like haven't been able to at oh, all. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. So individual impressions. Uh, let's go ahead and start with people who haven't, uh, said much. Uh, Torin, Olo? Uh, I'll go first, I guess. Um, was it, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I love this art very dearly. Like, uh, like I said last time, uh, every, basically every new arc we read is my favorite one <laughs> that week. <laughs> um, was it, um... I had, like, when I was first going through this, I, like, did a lot of, like, live tweeting <laughs> of this one, of just, like, pointing out things that I loved about it, or, like, saying, like, oh, I think this is going to happen, and it was very, it was a lot of fun. Um, there's, like, a couple scenes that I just loved dearly, or, like, things that I thought were really cool. Like, um, one scene that I'm always thinking about is like when uh, Rena. Let me pull it. Uh, when Rena manages to like trick Keichi with the fake bomb, and it says like, um, Rena lifts the hatchet mercilessly. She moves slowly as if everything is in slow motion. She almost looks holy. That line, even though it's like I know it's supposed to be scary, and it is, and it's ugh, God. This story is so full of love and empathy and just so much hard work and the aspects of horror are also not thrown to the wayside because like I'm a person who loves horror and I love when horror gets deep I also love when horror is, <laughs> is stupid but um I love that this is a horror game that has so much heart and care and just beauty to it and I love that it also points out this like this also thing of like when something scary is going on, uh, like we talked about last week or last time, um, when something really scary is happening or like traumatic, sometimes you'll focus on something that is like not really related. And like in this one where it's like focusing on how it looks like she's moving slow and that strange kind of terrifying beauty of it, it's like it feels holy. And I also love when Rena first um, sees Oyashiro and the the music that they go for, where it's this this terrifying instance of like her paranoia and like her delusions coming to a head. But also there's this just beautiful track going, and it's like this is a a religious experience. Like no matter if she saw like the the quote unquote real Oyashiro. Or if that was all just like a, a, a hallucination, this is real for her. And this is like her, this is like a, a religious experience. And it's just this terrifying, holy, beautiful thing. I, I just love the the range of this, this whole arc. And like, <laughs> even with like all the dumb Angel Mort stuff. And like, there's, there's so much to say about like all the bullshit, <laughs> the anime bullshit in this this whole series um was it there's a video that i watched a long time ago or not too long ago uh about a completely unrelated series uh i'll actually post it in the uh i'll post it in the the um discord chat but like it basically goes over both like an anime that was similar like around the same time like a little later but was also just like was known for being like shitty and stupid and horny and like um and it also goes into like a a bit of an examination of like why is it this anime got made <laughs> and yet <laughs> yes ursula i am talking about um oh not the elfin lead video the um the acan video but um like talking about why this kind of art got made why did this dumb anime get made 
what is going on with like the production, what is going on with like the the creator of it, what uh, and and just this exploration of like also like partially the doujin scene of Japan and partially the the shonen scene and it's like when you realize what the climate of art was at that time you're realizing like oh this is why shows from this era are so stupid in this way and this is why like fan works in this era are like this and why this is like this and it just explores a whole bunch of stuff which is unrelated to Higurashi but it also it helped me not love the dumb horny shit that was going on but like understand it a little more as like a a, a product of its time and also just like the the context of what the fan scene was like but yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's, I uh, that's what i have to say about this arc yeah it's interesting because you know a lot of this stuff the dumb horny stuff it's just like you know i think i said it in arc one but i mean we're talking about how old is keiichi like 14 15 mm -hmm. so i mean kid, dumb horny kids like fucking being stupid so it's kind of relatable in that way you know but anyway uh turin <laughs> you want to follow that up <laughs> oh boy <laughs> yeah i almost feel like i need to be taking notes of my own thoughts as people are talking <laughs> Because so oh, much trying. great stuff gets brought up during these discussions. It's like, oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> oh, man. I'll, I'll try to be brief, though. <laughs> no worries. Go ahead. So, um, very briefly, other people have already said this to a degree, but um, a lot of Rena's personal struggles are things that I personally related to. Um, I've struggled with depression. I've had experienced divorce, so I did not expect to encounter those things in a visual novel, <laughs> uh, you know, with, as you've said, you know, horny maid stuff in it. Uh, but I was, you know, very surprised and was like, I, not only was it present in there, but it was presented in a way I was like, wow, that actually gets me to thinking about some of my own experiences. Um, <laughs> I mean, okay, let me, let me bring this to a larger point. Like what, what, what is literature, man? <laughs> <laughs> Cause Fuck. Uh, I mean, we, you, you start this off, you read arc one and you're like, this is cool. This is like if Stephen King was an otaku and he wrote a, a visual novel and he had to draw everything himself. <laughs> and then you get to this point, you know, you get to the answer arcs. And you can have these five hour long discussions, you know, about each arc, you know, it's it, like it, it's already been said, there's a crazy amount of detail, character writing, historical, like so much goes into these. And it's like, I'm trying to think how, I mean, if this isn't literature, what is literature? But then also, how do you talk about this to other people? Like, how do you? bring this into that kind of discussion when it's like, well, you know, you can have that level of a, of a conversation about this sort of work, but then also it comes with all these caveats that, you know, again, the angel Mort scenes, all that stuff. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> are, are you, are you at the point now where it's like, well, you want to, <laughs> Well, I guess you are talking about it with other people, but <laughs> um, uh, how would you bring this outside of this circle of people? Like, d is this something that you think can be discussed outside of, you know, this hyper specific, you know, visual novel book club sort of thing? I think that um, assuming that was directed at me. Um, but, Sorry, uh, I, that should just be a general thing. I'm, I have, I'm habitually addressing you because I'm treating it like a conversation. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, do you want me to answer your question or? Please. It's, uh, I, I kind of jumped on that because it's, you, it's legitimately something that I've, I've thought about. Um, 
like yeah i i love doing the you know the chats and stuff and i think it's really helpful um not just for me but i think other other people in here um i mean y'all are talking with me for fucking four or five hours on these things like you, you wouldn't be here if you didn't get something out of it <laughs> um but like i have thought about how i would talk to other people normal people uh people who <laughs> people who haven't been corrupted by angel mort um about this stuff and it's, it is interesting because i'm like well simultaneously you you have some of the most immaculate beautiful character writing i've i've literally ever read ever like i know you you compared um uh, ryukishi to um uh stephen king uh, i i think he's better um i think that this is the, the character writing of this is like the best i've ever seen bar none and it's difficult to talk about that while also having you know the the angel mort bullshit the maid bullshit the stupid sex like horny bullshit the sexualization of children especially in the fucking anime holy fucking shit um especially in the context of like a horror thing where that can very easily be um turned into like an exploita exploitative thing which the anime fucking fell into thanks studio fucking dean anyway but the thing that i come away with is um i think i think that the the amazing thing about um ryukishi's writing and the thing that i fall back on whenever i think about sharing this with other people is that it stands on its own flaws and all i think that you can do the the seventh mod and then set it on the max censorship level and then just roll with that. But I think even me coming into it, um, having to deal with all that stupid bullshit, I think that the message behind everything it props all uh, like, it, it's like, it, it feels so fucking human. It feels so fucking like beautiful and flawed simultaneously in a way that I can wholeheartedly recommend it to people. Um, mm -hmm. With the caveat of being like, hey, you know, <laughs> it does get really horny at sections. Um, and, you know, I do not agree with sexualizing uh, uh, Satoko or uh, Rika, but at the same time, like, f Arc 3 is like some of the most powerful fucking uh, art I've ever experienced. So like of course I'm going to recommend that shit. So yeah, that I, does that answer your question? Um Yeah, yeah. Uh that's that's pretty much what I was um trying to figure out. I mean I'm sorry as a <laughs> I get caught up in my own head here, my own thoughts. And so by the time it came around to me, I got a little jumbled here. But, oh, no um, worries. No worries. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I think that um, the good far outweighs any bad that can be, you know, uh, taken away. I think that the empathetic storytelling here is so fucking good. And I'll, I'll take this like a million times over something like the... Um, <laughs> to revisit an old joke anyway um, but yeah uh, you ready? So, I, Bob I just wanted to ask you a question now that you're uh, this far into Higurashi how excited are you for Sonic LF? <laughs> uh, how excited can a human possibly be? That that's me um <laughs> I don't even give a, uh, th there is a, there is a part of me, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but there was a part of me, oh, you know, maybe a month or so ago that was like, visual novels are dumb. Visual novels are, why would I ever play a visual novel when I could just read a book or visual novels? Why would you even make a visual novel? You know, like, it's kind of like the same thing with why would you make a, um, a uh, uh, FMV game when you can just fucking shoot a movie, you know? And it's, don't get me wrong, some of them are, you know, come on, like, 
really the bunker you're really not going to be a movie anyway um it's just like fucking scams what that is um but I about the bunker yeah i wish i did too um fuck i'm jealous of you um but anyway but now it's like <laughs> I, th- I would i would actually uh, like love it unironically if silent hill f turns out to be a visual novel <laughs> like will i be disappointed a little bit just because of the potential that's in that's like in the air about Silent Hill F right now and what it could be. But that's always the case when, you know, something's announced. It's always like kind of the reason why, you know, it's a letdown when it's eventually, you know, re- the game actually comes out because it's, for me at least, because it's like the possibilities are endless right now. Like so many, it could be so many different things, but if it did turn out to be a visual novel, like, I would, f- I, I, there was a point where I wouldn't have even, I would have laughed at that announcement. I would have been like, this is a, this is a reason why Konami fell off. You know, this is, this is proof positive. And I'm sure that if they announced that, that that's the take that a lot of Silent Hill fans would go with. But having experienced Tigarashi now, I, uh, <laughs> I said it before, I'll say it again. Silent Hill F, F has more of a potential to be the best Silent Hill game. Like, we might finally, finally get a game that is either on par with or better than Silent Hill 2. And that is fucking crazy coming out of my mouth. Um, I am, I cannot stress how utterly excited I am for that. It is, yeah, anyway. Um, and then you have Silent Hill 2 Remake. Anyway. <laughs> fucking hell. Anyway. I'm going to fight Bloober Team on top of a fucking rooftop. Except this time I'm actually going to fucking kill him. Anyway. Um, <laughs> well, part of me wants to say that. Uh, just like uh, I mentioned that the rest of the world forgot the bunker. I feel like if Silent Hill F, uh, you know, lives up to, you know... But we know Ryuk Kishi can do. Uh, people are just gonna forget about the Silent Hill Two remake. Just when you compare the two, one will. <clears throat> yeah. It will be forgotten. Just oh, this was a remake of a game that was much better, way better. Whereas I, I think the possible impact that a Silent Hill F will have is way more powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you could see the Silent Hill F. Um, announcement as like Konami realizing that hey maybe we need to do something with this IP instead of retreading it you know like constantly doing HD remasters of everything which is super forward looking for them Um, uh, I don't you know I'm uh, I do not trust them at fucking all but I trust Ryukishi I trust that he's also that's the other amazing thing he's <clears throat> how like how this this Hiroshi's from 2002 you know he's already done Umineko he's already done what many people consider to be the best visual novel let alone best written media ever done ever written so like how many lessons has this dude learned <laughs> and we're going to get my stupid uh uh a fucking um ghost town game series is gonna get this dude working in it that's fucking that's fucking crazy that's that's absolutely amazing that's i wow okay konami made a fucking good decision i i can't believe it but it happened um probably because they were like i i can imagine that something fucked up happened at konami that led to this decision where suddenly accidentally like Ryukishi requested like uh, to to make a game and they were like eh how much you, how much money you needed and he was like ah th- this much and they're like really that much okay go for it or like there was a zero left off on a contract somewhere and they're just going to crunch the fuck out of Ryukishi and oh god I don't want to think about that um that would suck much like they crunched other people anyway yeah I'd knock on wood if I had any I only got metal. Knock on metal. Um, Here, I'll do it for you. 
I, I have also knocked on wood for okay. you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was like, I know, I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> I could, I could, the I think our mics are just like uh, not picking it up. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, yeah, let right. me do it better. No, I won't. I guess <laughs> no. we should go. I'm back in a hotel to... right now. I can't do that. <laughs> we should probably go back to um the other people's uh you know general thoughts. Um, yeah, absolutely. We... Who has not gotten a chance to talk very much? Gail, I don't think it has said much. Us. Um. Well, did numbers want to talk at all? I know that you're you were kind of a little bit off, but. Uh, I mean, if no one else, uh... I... I think Higurashi is neat. <laughs> yeah! Agree. Yeah. Woo. That's very Woo. good. Woo. Um, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. talk a little bit about this, but I'm probably going to engage more with sort of a couple of political things instead. Uh, I will say... Really like this arc. It's very good. Uh, stuff with Reyna made me cry. Thought it was really well done. Uh, not a lot of media deals with divorce and how traumatic it is and how many adults can kind of forget about the negative effect of it on children. It's very good. Uh, it's very fun. It's a very fun and snappy arc. I, the way that it engages and answers a lot of questions from previous mysteries. Mwah, perfect. Um, but yeah, it's fantastic arc. Um, three major things I think about when it comes to the more specific details, one of which I've already talked about in terms of mental illness. Um, I can say a little bit more about that, but I wanted to lead with two things that are rooted in the final tip, one of which Tokyo Siren Gas Attack, other one, Barakam and Discrimination. I want to specifically yeah, talk okay. about- I'm sorry? Finally get to talk about it. Yay, yeah. <laughs> so this arc ends talking about how the people um, who were outside of Hinamazawa at the time, but are like survivors, uh, family who are related to uh, people who were from Hinamazawa just generally, now try to hide that. Some of them have kind of like changed their names, their last names. Some people have kind of tried to slip away from awareness due to that because of such a severe discrimination against them and against the thought of this town that uh, already had a very negative connotation. Barakamin um, is a term that it would literally translate to like village people. And I previously had mentioned that this is a remainder of caste systems that existed in Japan uh, that was technically uh, made illegal during the Meiji period right before 1900. The problem is that discrimination still continued. Most uh, Barakamen and most of their descendants had to live in villages, did not have as much schooling, um, oftentimes were denied jobs. Um, in this point in time in the 80s, Barakamen and their descendants would actively their information would be sold even in cases where they were trying to hide their family history uh, to other people who were uh, to, I'm sorry, to businesses. Like businesses would actively buy like this book for like 300,000 people in order to literally discriminate against them. Um, and one of the very interesting things that I think Ryukishi's carefully alluding to is that idea of how the Sonozaki's part of their wealth did come from like and and obviously like Shion's story about it being cannibalism is fake but the aspects of like yes we have a history related to can meat um I I, I do believe is and that itself is very heavily related to how Barakamin themselves were usually doing jobs like butchering, meat handling, um, and other sort of like undertaker services, burying the dead, burying like say animals that have died and can't be used in meat processes. So from its very core, the people of Hinamazawa, they're, they are village people. They are people who, um, uh, a lot of people historically weren't able to go to high school. The uh, the, the school that exists in town only exists because Chie actively went there 
and basically fought to have it. There's like a very potentially high chance that these children would not have an education without Chie. Um, you have the issues of sort of like the wealth, you have the issues of sort of like the very specific personal culture they have, which a lot of Barakamen did actually have because of how they were pushed outside of prototypical Japanese culture. Um, and Ryukishi himself in interviews has actually said that one of the issues that he really wishes people would be more cognizant of is Barakamen discrimination, because many, many people overlook it or refuse to really engage with it as a real thing that is still affecting people today to the point that even in the 2000s um barakim and descendants are still like going and trying to get better protections uh, due to it it's only very recently that japan technically made it illegal for um places of business uh or places of like when you look for employment, like they can't request or they can't pull up your koseki, which is your family registry. So <laughs> there's a lot of things here and him mentioning explicitly how the discrimination against the descendants and the relations of people from Hinamazawa to Barakaman discrimination is an incredibly pointed moment in a time period when people act like they don't exist anymore. The other aspect of that that I did previously mention is that one of the biggest crime circle, uh, organized crime circles in Japan is like 70% Barakamen descendants because many of these people are pushed into organized crime or other things because they have so long been denied regular employment and also they uh, are coming from a generational poverty, which is something you see a lot here in America or Latin American countries, like that kind of parallel. And the question of like how these people or like why the Sonazaki family or why like Akade ended up marrying someone connected to the Yakuza, you can see sort of like, hey, we already kind of have this shared lineage this shared discrimination against one another we may as well try to have some way to protect our people um because without that like what can we do and that coming to a head with the hinamazawa dam that they attempted to build it really spoke to sort of like the power that the sonazakis were able to push for um or even just like you remember um oreo had like that really big raffle at this year's uh hinabazawa festival mm -hmm. with like a ton of shit that was really expensive and they're like oh we can't do this again but she's like i want to give the people of this village wealth i want to give them belongings i want to give them things that they don't already have she knows that they won't accept it unless it's like in a raffle contest because she knows this village like the back of her hand and she is an incredibly flawed person but even with those little things that she does you can see so much of her knowledge and understanding of sort of their connection to things like barakam and discrimination and that is something that in america we really don't know anything about and i think that that is an incredibly important context uh in fact like barakam and um groups that were made to fight against discrimination were backed by the communist parties and the socialist parties of japan they were considered to be extremist leftist groups in some cases so again we sort of see like how nationalism and right-wing politics in japan is intended to create a broader homogeny whereas a lot of the left-wing politics were constantly like affording and contributing money and support to these minority groups and these people who experience discrimination. So, very interesting. Um, Tokyo Sarin gas attack is something that would have still been in pretty recent memory when Ryukishi was writing this. Um, but I think part of why he went with sort of like this gasoline in high school is because it is very absurdist. There were things that were changed even with Reina in terms of uh, her hatchet that she carries around because there was kind of a similar attack where kids were I think either harmed or killed and so you see so many layers where like he is a paying attention to the news so he creates this in totally insane concept where it's like how is she going to get all this gasoline and is attempting to use that to express 
a much more down to earth issue in terms of how cults were able to use people's mental illness, people's struggles against them. Um, the cults at the core of the Tokyo Sarin gas attack was very well known for taking advantage of people who were in poverty, for people who were families of divorce, for people who were like minority groups even, by trying to pull them in, trying to engage with them as people who had been wronged by uh, Japan and the Japanese government, as well as like, cults are such a huge issue even today in Japan. And those are, and the sarin gas attack was very heavily connected to um, the Japanese uh, asset bubble popping in the mid in the mid nineties. It happened in 1996. And even though only like 12 people died or so, thousands of people were injured by that. They took these like bags basically onto the train and after it started moving, they stabbed them with umbrellas to start releasing the gas. And they were hoping it would kill many more people, but it wasn't as potent as they would have expected. They had actually planned this out and attempted it in a couple of other ways to see how well it would work previously even. Like this was a known issue and they were still able to go forward with these plans and come on to the <clears throat> subways with that. And so much of the harm done, like there is still people who have chronic conditions due to that today. So, um... But yeah, the relevance of that here is really interesting, especially in terms of when you consider like, oh, a volcanic gas came afterward and killed everyone. It, just very real and very tragic um, ideas. And for a cult that is deeply centered around manipulating minority groups while still engaging with nationalism and extremism and literal fascism is, I think, a topic that is, again, very relevant to what's going on here. So... That's probably um, my main points. It's super helpful. Thank you very much, Gail. Like you're always a treasure trove of information and it's very important uh, to understand, uh, give context to the story because it really just shows that like a lot of this is Ryukishi kind of working through, um, like I would imagine working through um, reactions and just thoughts on this in general and i mean reading about the uh, barakaman um on wikipedia it's like wow this is so uh, one i had no idea um about any of this um but two it bears so much it bears so much resemblance to the story uh that we're reading like we're like it's it's kind of shocking um how on the nose, a lot of um, uh, Ryukishi's writing is, um, it's, yeah, it's super, super good, and it's useful, I would say, is the word. Um, we can learn something from this. Um, yeah. And I, I did link some very cool, that kind of long essays in the uh, in the games chat and the thread that I made, so there's mm. more information about Barakam in there, because it can be very difficult to find information about how they are affected even today that wikipedia article is pretty lacking in terms of like yeah how intense of an issue it is but um it, it's a great starting point yeah i was like wow this is a pretty short article all things considered um doesn't seems like there should be more here but anyway i guess something's better than nothing um but yeah Anyway, um, <clears throat> cool. Uh, well, cool. <laughs> Fucking word usage. It's, anyway. Uh, I guess, I don't know. I I felt like I should have said something when Gil asked if everyone was done. But I was going to say, Ludzu, you, you, you were kind of, you were kind of silent. So you want to go? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry for, I feel like I'm sending the fanfare away from being the last one. I'm sorry, Gil. Like I'm, I'm sorry. I, I want to hear everyone talk. Okay, please talk. Okay. Um. So, yeah, I guess just like taking it just out of like how I reacted with, from the chapter the first time is just that like, I mean, not how much I reacted. Just like 
taking what it's doing thematically, I guess, that, like, um, because at this point, it's kind of clear that um, he's sort of working with paranoia as a form of distrust and, like, um, that it's essentially, like, seeing all these protagonists' perspectives, that it's, like, the way we're sort of told the story, but that, um, with the case of Rena, it's, like, very clearly, um, shown as delusional, and it's, like, our first just clear sense of that, essentially, because, like, we have Casey, who's sort of, like, our blank slate, um, so to speak, um, and Shion is sort of like on the guys that like you may you may think what she's doing is like like she, or that you can sort of understand why she's doing what she's doing in a sense. Um, Renna's sort of takes on like I don't I, I guess I don't know how to say it. It's just like a really amplified quality that it's like you sort of look at it, her talking about aliens or whatever, and that it's like. Yeah, like, yeah, I think there's something up here with, like, the problems these people are facing is that there's uh, distrust and lack of communication. And that's essentially what um, the mystery is, what mystery is sort of coded as in Higurashi, that it's essentially um, something to be overcome through belief in friends and the necessity of communication. And, like, um... It, it's like extra affecting too because like I guess it for a couple for a couple reasons. One is just like um where Ryukishi is sort of coming from from the uh game's history side of this, because like um I think there's an idea that um with Higurashi, Ryukishi is like injecting horror elements into like a Bishujo game or whatever. Um, like, that's something he did on his own, uh, or not on his own, but, like, that's something that games didn't do until that point, but there's, like, a tension always, like, that's been there of, like, uh, not just horror in visual novels, like, you know, like, I don't want to go, too, like, way too far into this, but, like, um, with sound, with, like, Chunsoft sound novels, which, um, Higurashi takes the sound novel thing as, like, a... Or, I guess, just when they cry in general, takes the sound novel thing as, like, referring back to that history of horror in visual novels. But, like, um, that... Literally, the first visual novels that, like, look a lot like Higurashi does with, like, character sprites and text on screen the way it shows and like even the backgrounds that are like washed out the way they are um it's like the very first ones were dealing with delusion and like madness and stuff like that but like it's just more of like a condition of how do i put this because like Game, games made by Leaf that were the first visual novels, like Shizuku and Kizuwato. I might post more about this in the thread. And um, there's a video by Bowl of Lentils that goes into this uh, pretty well, I think. One's called The Origins of Visual Novels, and one specifically by Leaf. Um, but, like... I get, like, the, th the thing with uh, stories like Shizuku... Suzuku and Kizuwato, those are sort of like made by a company that were um, in the otaku tradition, basically, but sort of expressing, or it's sort of like an expression of like psychological horror, for lack of a better word, like that these characters were sort of having delusions and dealing with madness. And it's like the difference between them and Ryukishi is that I think you can only really take that delusion as just like a condition or like a sign of a sort of anxiety about being otaku in a way not that it actually addresses otaku stuff but that it like um that you sort of feel that in there like a worry of being like 
like not properly in line with society in some way or that like um like i worry that you're just sort of like basically just basically that you're out of step and like i think ryukishi really wants to make this work in order to like address that sort of anxiety properly um that that this is something that can be overcome and that this is something that not only is it just like something to be overcome in the sense of like you can enter society normally um but that like this that the sense of being um an otaku is actually some like uh, actually a big step towards freeing yourself from that and like sort of internalizing that within yourself and also finding like something to relate to in other people um i don't know i'm, just, like, I'm trying to also relate this to like the, like my second point with this or i guess also uh, one more thing on that point is that like um like the thing with seventh expansion um is that they are a doujin circle and not like it, it's just fundamentally different i think from like companies making visual novels even if they are sort of uh catering to an otaku audience or whatever um that they like they are in it as like fans doing this like pretty much as a hobbyist thing like they were there like they were selling higurashi as like a serial story by by yearly or however you say that um which sort of feeds into the mystery too in an interesting way as, as like a serialized work with audience feedback and stuff like that uh but i don't know they're like that's sort of important to understand i think that they're like in this um as like as the, like trying to make that tie with the audience like more directly than just you know making a prop like making a property to like i mean they're selling it you know but it's not like a commercial property in the same way it's authentic um, it's authentic well, it's, it's... yeah um i guess sort of tie this up with the second point is that like I guess talking about like Keishi tying into this, like that he's can sort of be seen as like, he's, I mean, you go into Higurashi and he's like the normal, you sort of can see him as like a normal Galaga protagonist that he's just sort of like, um, I mean, you sort of go into thinking like this is going to be, um, like there's just romance roots or whatever like that, and it's like. It's not like he it's not like he wasn't trying to do that at all. But um I think he really wants to like through Keiichi especially, or not just Keiichi especially, but like the connection you make in this chapter with Keiichi and Reina as like like thinking back to when Reina talking about being in a pile of trash that like she doesn't like she doesn't value um her own interests in a sense and like this is a collection of things that she cherishes um and also i mean she's also just like very hard to not just see her as like you know autistic glompy girl with like just absolute obsession with cute things like it's hard to like even if these characters aren't otaku like textually or have like clear signifiers of it they are like playing into that with stuff like that also like Mion's obsession with games and like uh that she started the club pretty much to uh just sort of bring to people together through games and things like that um Ludzio, i think uh you made a mistake uh rena's not into cute things oh she's not she's into coyote things that's gotta, true you yeah gotta emphasize there is a difference yeah it's so only reno only reno knows <laughs> but yeah like the um i guess connecting with keishi like when he sort of learns about what his sin is supposedly like from 
from Onikakushi and like just going back to those chapters Onikakushi is so sad like to reread it's so lonely it's like in the sense of like he just can't put his guard down he's like it's one thing that like he is kind of being over dramatic or some stuff but it's only because like he is like genuinely scared um and like going from there to watanagashi where like there's that part where he um where he's where he confesses to rika about like um what he thinks going on what he thinks going on or like the uses like the cat metaphor and he's like scared to death to, even to use this metaphor with rika it takes a lot out of him to say that um but like then later where you know rika goes missing and he like regrets it's like he almost regrets saying this in a sense but like i don't know and basically like I think Higurashi wants you to understand that, like, um, being open with your friends, just like, or like trusting your heart with this sort of thing, is like, it is like Watanagashi and Tatari Goroshi are come off as much as like less tragic to me than Onikakushi because Keiichi tried to make that connection, even like. In Wataragashi, even though he was scared, he tried. And like in Tatari Goroshi, even though he was like not going about it the right way, even though he even though he didn't he's like missing just something about the finer points of his relationship with his friends, like he tries and he wants to express his love in some way. Like I think basically I like going like go back to like the dating protagonist thing or not I keep getting the terms mixed up but like I think it actually really works as work because it wants you to like if there's if he's meant to be the stand-in for the player or whatever I think he wants you to understand that like someone like him is um not someone to just like observe people's lives but someone that like you know has history to consider has like i don't know like he like it's not just that he has like love to give but that he wants to give love because others have given him love um and like i don't know, like it's just i feel like i'm trying to make a bunch of connections with the other what other people are saying too but like um i guess to end, i guess to end on this like going back to what turn said about um how do we talk about like is higurashi literature like it i think it just sort of subliminates the fact that um visual no or just not even visual novels but that like games like don't need to defend themselves i think like they're all there and Ryukishi was simply, not simply, like he did a lot of work, but he was acting on the potential that was already within games and visual novels to make the story to reach a, like, if, if not a broader audience, at least reach a very specific person, I think, Ve a bunch of very specific people. And that is, I think, invaluable. I think you really nailed something i mean you nailed several things there but one of the main things is that um keichi is a stand-in for the audience um and then revealing his, his sordid past is kind of a hint uh, to the people playing that hey you're coming from somewhere too you're like w how you communicate with other people is also highly highly influenced with uh your upbringing and how you were uh, you know um, how you interacted with your parents as a child and, and all those um, connections that you have. What I'm saying is um, Higurashi was the first Strand game um, before Death Stranding. Um, it, it's all about connections. It's all about... Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I'm joking, but at the same time, like you also mentioned, there, there was a wonderful line um, 
toward the end where uh, I believe it was Keiichi says um, uh, insane people are scary because um, the, you can't communicate with them because the lines of communication have been severed or um, disrupted. And I think that that's actually, yeah, really poignant and uh, into understanding um, why you should never um, sort of, you know, cast someone uh, as insane um, because you may be considering them a lost cause uh, when they are when they are totally within the realm of um, uh, not savior but like communication like they can be reached um, it's yeah so much of this story is about how we talk to each other how we communicate with each other how we um, re uh, react and you know live our lives with each other and it's 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 really powerful um it's very yeah it's very good very good good is the word i'm gonna use because my vocabulary is so immense and full of nuance that good will suffice <laughs> something uh, oh, oh uh, I'll, I'll try and be quick but um i do uh thank you for sharing that Sue. and um i do think that like, uh, <laughs> A good, uh, mm. there's that word again. <laughs> uh, well, I, I can be hard on like otaku stuff and like, um, you know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> I have my I have complex feelings about many subcultures. Um, with otaku, I definitely think a lot of it is, um, it is like a, an expression of like lonely people. That's kind of the stereotype, but it's like the thing about otaku and like otaku doesn't necessarily always mean just obsessed with anime, but like it's that's what a what it usually is now. But um a lot of it is people who are very, very uh into something and like um kind of obsessed with it to the point where it's like it's starting to become like a problem and they're getting like lonely and cut off from anyone who isn't also an otaku and like um i do think part of also why this is me trying to like divine reasoning from uh, ryukishi but i think part of also why all that otaku like garbage is in higurashi is because he is trying to reach an otaku audience of like i think that ryukishi does see that there is like um I do think that by being in the doujin scene, it shows that not only is Ryokishi wanting to be like an artist and is an artist, but also like there is love for like otaku in that scene where it's like, this is, it's the indie scene where it's like, yeah, there's a bunch of freaks here, but also there's a bunch of people who are fantastic and wonderful. And I I'd never would have met them if I wasn't in this scene with a, <laughs> with a bunch of losers. So it's like, trying to reach otaku by having like a not a bait and switch but like something that is a little palatable to to get you started and then as it goes on that kind of like wanes it doesn't completely go away but it, it like lessens a bit so it's like people who are, aren't otaku or who are like finding themselves like drifting out of the scene still have something to to go back to and like and really quick uh, to, to spoil one of my favorite movies, um, I do think also that Higurashi works as a, a horror series, a, a, a deeply empathetic horror, because it, much like uh, this movie called like um, They Look Like People, it, it deals with the kind of inherent horror and loneliness and just like kind of like beautiful, terrifying trust you put into other people by like... Um, by like subjecting yourself to the the horror of being known it's like yeah i'm i'm trusting myself with you and like i trust you to treat me as a person and to care about me and to not hurt me and that's so incredibly terrifying and scary and i'm probably scaring you too because i'm i'm scared myself and i'm doing things that are that are strange and alien to you but but I'm hoping that you'll treat me like a person and you'll come at me and like, trust me and let me trust you kind of a thing. Yeah. 
That's really good. Uh, yeah, I think horror has a really strong ability um, to get people to think new thoughts about what they're doing, why they're doing it. And I think that couching um, this sort of, this is kind of almost like a re rehabilitative, like otaku um, series. It's very, that's a very, I had that idea, but I didn't know if it was like, you know, something everybody else was having. So I kind of kept it to myself, but at the same time, like it's kind of, it's kind of on, it's kind of on the surface of the story, isn't it? It's kind of, you know, you can kind of see this as, as like a story about, oh, these, these care these girls are so sexy. Oh, these girls, oh man, they're, I remember being put, and there was that one line from that fucking dude at Angel Mort. It's always, it's always the Angel Mort scenes, um, where he was like, oh, I've got a version of Higurashi that has all the girls in different outfits. Hell Yeah. Uh, you want it? I can give it to you if you let me go in there and look at girls and stuff. And it's like, okay, okay. This is a person who, like, especially from arc one, you, or I'm sorry, arc two, um, where Angel Moore played a bigger role, um, who kind of understands the space. Like, that just comes out through the writing. But, um, yeah, seeing, seeing this is, like, from that perspective of, like, seeing these girls is, like, you know, how Otaku would kind of in, engage with the story and then understand throughout the the rest of it that oh these are you know these aren't these aren't just like two-dimensional characters to, that you're meant to like you know press a to fall in love with or like whatever but they're fully formed like characters people <laughs> who have you know dreams and like wants and and deserve respect it's it's pretty easy to see how you know people could map that onto their own lives and actually reform some communications and like that could actually help them out in the real fucking world it's pretty meta as some black femme says in the chat meta the fourth wall bro we broke it um and what was there angel mort um <laughs> god damn it anyway you keep talking about that place, and I have no idea what you're talking about. Ah, uh, don't worry about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, me neither. Don't worry about it. It's It takes place in another dimension. Uh, Maybe the true friends were the cakes we fucked along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, also, uh, it just occurs to me, is Takano a timeline walker like Rika? I had that idea. Anyway. I'm good. I'm going to call them timeline walkers right now because I like making up bullshit. Um, but anyway, did anyone else have anything else to say other than uh, NPC face or whatever that is, Dohi Wario? So, <laughs> oh, some black friends. Something, uh, something I was uh, thinking of, uh, kind of related to that with the idea of trust and the idea of like opening up to people and all that i feel like one thing i really love about higurashi because there are a lot of works that like espouse the importance of friendship there are a lot of works that espouse the importance of trust right higurashi i think does a really good job of depicting both why it's so important to trust people and why it's so important to like form these connections and also why it's so hard to and why people aren't able to like in the case of rena why it's so hard for her to open up you know like in the case of keichi why he is you know, like sometimes finds it so difficult to trust people around him like it's very good at illustrating both why it's important and why people don't do it and I think that to me that really rings to me as powerful because it also makes these characters so much more like interesting and fully formed to me that uh, and like to a certain extent more courageous that they are having these breakthrough moments you know that they are able to trust the people around them 
because we've seen why they wouldn't, why they wouldn't be able to. And I don't know, it, stuff like that just really hits me. Yeah. You know, it's also interesting, it occurs to me that in this story, like the the arcs that we're seeing throughout it, can really just serve as like, a you know, you is it could serve. You can easily map that to you thinking about alternate versions of yourself or like your friends and all these different things. But mainly the the decisions that you choose to make, and I think that this also this story also helps to highlight that it's important to you know uh, really. Um, think about how your actions affect other people and the domino effect that that can cause and really you know a lot but also it's really cool because it's like the story is also about people making mistakes and being human and those mistakes not necessarily you know being the worst things in the world and you can move on from them and it's just there's so much here there's so much it's like one big cake that you gotta fuck anyway <laughs> One big fuckable cake. <laughs> <laughs> what am I referencing? Who knows? Anyway, does anyone else have anything uh, other this? Uh, anything else to say? I think you nailed it on the head that that um, these even the most smallest actions have like effects on like the people close to you, and but they're not like permanent. There's still a future to the rest of your life that where these actions you you might cause harm but there's the the pathway to uh forgiveness and redemption is always present as long as you keep moving forward and i'm really excited for um that message to be turned inward because it really feels like that's where we're going with this story it's there's so much about forgiveness and compassion and I think that a lot of stories like this, it's really easy to give that forgiveness and compassion to other people, but it's so hard to do it for yourself. I don't know why that is necessarily. I'm sure that there's more research to be done there, but I would love it if the story goes that way. And I really hope that that's the way that um, Satoko's story goes because, ah, man. I know people who are, you know, hurting themselves and feeling shitty because of, you know, stuff they think was their fault, but was totally out of their fucking, uh, you know, capability uh, to, you know, sometimes you just, you, you know, you can't, you know, get away from the shit that's happened in the past. And, you know, it's so fucking difficult to forgive yourself. Um, uh, for that kind of thing. And yeah, I hope that we can all forgive ourselves for that, uh, bullshit that happens in our lives and we can see our mistakes and move on from them and see them as mistakes. Um, but anyway, I don't know where I'm going. I'm kind of tired. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, need to... uh, I just do want to quickly bring up what Miss Insanity said in chat and just that it's just not just the power of friendship. It's that the power of friendship is still a, a hard fucking work. Yeah. 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 And with that, I hope everybody <laughs> uh, happy uh, Christmas Eve, by the way. Um, it just, it it's 1246 a.m. Christmas. What's that? Can you believe it, guys? Only one week until Christmas. Oh, Christmas is wow. just a week away. I can't <laughs> believe it. Whoa. So many... Almost Christmas doesn't mean it was Christmas. <laughs> God, I, now I'm worried the area is going to show up at my fucking front door dressed like a fucking Santa Claus. Ah! I don't know why I'm saying that. Anyway, I just dropped my fidget thing that i've been messing around with it's actually the cap to this camera hi uh hello uh thank you very much for joining um i want to thank everybody all of these wonderful folks oh, I'm gonna go, there you go all these wonderful folks here uh 25 aka numbers arp gale indestructible cat lara high ludzu murder bear olo talzriel turin and yon thank you very much 
Thank you. Uh, special, uh, again, special, special thanks to Jan for putting together. Um, oh, I don't know. Let's go to view, uh, or I'm sorry, tools word count for putting together 8,518 words over 25 pages just for this stream. Jan, you are, I, you are the realist. Um, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, Fresh and Gluten Free says, ho, ho, ho. So, yes. Um, I can't tell if that's Santa or Satoko. Why not both? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Combine them together. Put Satoko in a Santa outfit. Santoko? Santoko, yes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, fan art. I commission it now. Oh, Miss Consanity, I beat you to it. Ha, 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 ha. Read him and weep. Uh, but yes, thank you everybody. Um, I will return with another stream in a week. Um, taking the next week off reminder and, uh, yeah. Hey, uh, treat your friends well and tr treat yourself well as well. I hope everybody has a great one and thank you very much for joining and I'll catch you later. Everyone say bye or what's a good meme? To end me. On. Me. <laughs> me. me. Everyone say me. 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 Hey, I'm walking over me. <laughs> hey, I'm me and over here. Me. 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 Bye. And I'm Zawa. <laughs> Hina Mizawa. <laughs> hey, I'm Damn. Hina Mizawa over here. Oni Gafuchi. <laughs> All right. Uh, enjoy the, your your cake fucking. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>